They use a lot of them. <laughs> Are you ready? Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. Okay, our first item that's marked on the agenda for, um, for this evening is a presentation regarding funding request additional sponsorship funds by the Marion Arts Festival. Uh, Deb, are you presenting or? Oh. Yeah, she's, Jill is on via Zoom. Okay. So Jill Ackerman, the president of the Marion Chamber of Commerce is with us via Zoom. Hi everyone. Hi Jill. So is, and Deb is there, is that right? Yes, Deb Bailey's here. Okay. Deb, did you want me to start? Sure. Okay. Um, so we are just here to request some additional hotel motel funds from the city of Marion to support this year's Marion Arts Festival. I think we detailed a lot of the um, uh, items out in a memo to the council just kind of giving the reasoning why we why we need the additional funding we haven't had an in-person festival since um 2019 and um over the last couple last year we did a digital festival um obviously not as successful as our as our in-person um event but we have had to give back a lot of sponsorship dollars um and a lot, uh, and obviously all of the artist fees that we collect uh, because we just weren't able to produce um, an event at the caliber that we normally are able to produce. Marian Arts Festival, for those of you that don't know, is one of the top festivals in the nation for one day festivals. So it's a 50 person juried art festival. Um, typically we don't have a lot of, um, Iowa artists, a lot of local artists, a lot of them come from out of state. So it, uh, historically, it's been very good for tourism. It draws a crowd of over 10,000 people. So it's Marion's largest event. It's always the third Saturday in May. So it's a kickoff um, to our summer events. Um, and it, it's just been very successful. Um, we support a lot of different nonprofits in the area. We give to a lot of food banks through one of our programs known as Empty Bowls, um, where local students make pottery and we sell that at the festival and give all the proceeds to our local food pantries. It's a free event for everyone to attend. So um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's probably some of our patrons only access to arts and high quality arts and culture throughout the year. So that's one of the things that we're very proud of. Um, we have had a lot of success in going out and kind of restructuring our sponsorship levels. And we've had success in gaining some new sponsors. So we're very excited about that. But I know that we're also interested in adding some new programming, um, given that we've been um, out of the park for two years and all of the awesome changes that have happened in Uptown Marion. Um, we really want to bring the festival back at its highest level um, and show off all of the wonderful streetscape, the new library, every, all the great things that are happening with Broad and Main. We've added a lot of new um, restaurants and retailers since 2019. 
and we are just running into a little bit of a gap in funding. Um, so we wanted to come to the city council and see if there's a possibility to um, to get some additional funds to to kind of um, help lift us out uh, this year. Deb, do you have anything else to add? Sure. Yeah, please come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Deb Bailey. I'm the director of the festival. Thanks for your time very much. And thank you for the $4,000 in hotel motel support this year. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that the memo that, that you have in your packets is largely devoid of specifics because we do have a target need. And that is to ask your consideration for an additional $4,000 in support of our Gazette special section, which serves as the festival program and appears in the Gazette the Sunday before the festival uh, and goes out to 38,000 households. Uh, typically, it's a 12 page program. Um, this is one from 2013 that I, I worked from home and this is what I could find. It's faded and a little bit sad and eight pages, but if you'd like to take a look at it, I would be happy to bring it up or if it's not necessary. Here, I will bring it up and then you can just... Thanks, Deb. The, the, the Gazette sells ads as part of their in-kind commitment to us, which, well, I'm gonna back up, that, that we would like to add four pages to our 12 page insert that typically um, without Gazette support, the cost of each page is a thousand dollars. Their ad, ad sales and other in-kind considerations brings that cost to us down to about $700, which is that, that with, with the other print advertising and web ad, advertising support that they give us, uh, they're one of our major sponsors. Um, we would like to add four pages to highlight everything that's been happening uptown. One page would be devoted to the new library and the program collaborations that we hope to do with them. We are eliminating food vendors, closing 7th Avenue, or rather we will ask to do that, <coughs> and embrace Uptown Marion as the festival's food court, uh, that, that uh, the chamber will be working with them on uh, presentation and specials and sidewalk offerings. And we would like for one of our pages to feature not just those restaurants and bars, but also Marion's retail businesses. Um, a third would be devoted to the uh, 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 capital improvement projects, what has been completed, what's planned for the future, uh, artist renderings of the park, uh, broad and main, just everything that has happened and will be happening uptown. And finally, uh, a page about alternative routes and parking, anything that we can do to demonstrate to the public that construction is not a barrier to attendance. At the festival, and the more people we bring uptown, the more people will come back. Um, we're asking for full funding for those pages because the landscape has changed so much since 2019 that we don't know who the advertisers still are that are out there. Uh, that that obviously we believe in in the Gazette and their mission and commitment to us, but. If that, that if you're able to provide us some support, I feel like we could guarantee having those four pages to devote to what's happening in Marion. Okay, so the, 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 the total request is $4,000? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, and how many, how many years has the festival been going on? Oh, hey, this is our 30th annual. 30th, so. Just for everyone's perspective here, um, in in my opinion, this is unless the staff tells us our their their the funds aren't available in hotel motel, I think it's kind of a no brainer because uh, I think there's no more obvious 
a place to put hotel motel funds and into the Marian Arts Festival long before Marian had all this momentum and all, all these great things that have put us on the map. The Marian Arts Festival is what put Marian on the map. Um, and that's, that's what Marian was known for from 30 years ago till now. And it, and it has put us on a national stage uh, being one of the best arts festivals in the country. So I know you're not here for that, but I wanna take the opportunity to thank you on behalf of the community for everything you've done for this festival and you poured your heart and soul into making it what it is. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do. Any questions for Deb? Any questions for Jill? Jill, are you still with us? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick. Um, so the advertising for it in the request is for this insert through the Gazette. And then there's obviously a larger budget that goes into other options. Is everything as far as directions driven through this insert? Or are there like apps that people are downloading or using or connecting to to help navigate some of it? That, that uh, uh, all web advertising clicks through to our website. Uh, the Gazette supports us with web ads. KCRG, that that's part of their in-kind to us. Uh, social media, that, that, that we, uh, uh, we have a, a, a fairly large and faithful social media audience and we put a significant part of our advertising budget into social media promotions just to engage people and, and share information. And I don't know if that answered your question. I think so that, um... I know you do, and I love the festival, and I follow along, and I check the website, and we've missed it um, since we haven't been able to have it. It just feels like it isn't a complete month of May without getting to experience that. So um, I was just curious, as you were going through the directions and the changes in this ever-evolving and next steps for folks and how other people get information that, you know, we have all those avenues laid out to get them to Uptown. That, that, that in a usual year, about one-third of our overall budget is spent on promotions. Uh, one third of it goes to just boots on the ground in the park. They have supplies, security, just everything necessary to put on a show. Uh, and, and another third for administration and staff expenses. And so and no matter how much money we have, that ratio is consistent. So we we're committed to advertising to the best of our ability because and 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 uh, that that. You may have seen or heard this before. I think I used it in the memo and, and I say it again because I think it's the most important thing that there's no point in throwing a big art party unless you send out the invitations and advertising serve as our invitations. And, and, and even if people already know about us, just to, just to catch Marion on the billboard, <clears throat> starts them thinking about, oh gosh, what date is it? And do I have anything else on that Saturday? I sure hope I don't. So, so investing in getting the word out is, um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say more important than the portable toilets, but certainly as important. I know Colette has a question. Just a comment and then a question for our staff. So very great. Um, festival in my short tenure here I've purchased a couple pieces and it's they bring great joy so I appreciate the hard work that you've put into this <laughs> event my second question is just a you can if we can just have a quick reminder of sort of the hotel hotel motel budget and how much money we typically have in there and what the criteria is and how we spend it Test. Like yeah, thank one. you. <laughs> so we're working on the budget right now. Leanne's actually in her office working on that. Now, would this be something that we can email out to the council um, after tonight's meeting? We can get that back to you. Yep. Um, I, I do want to do want to just add. I was uh, uh, texting uh, Jill Ackerman um, to to clarify the the request is not for four thousand. It's for an additional four thousand. This past year, this past fiscal year, in FY22, we awarded 6,000. So the total request is for 10,000 this year. Um, we were, if, if I may, that, that uh, uh, our hotel motel allocation for the upcoming event was $4,000. And, and again, thank you very much. This request is, an, is for an additional $4,000 specifically to support the sure. insert. 
Steve, uh, did, did you ask your I'm good, thank okay. you. Totally in support. I just think that'd be a good review for us, so thank you. We'll go with Steve and then Grant. Go ahead. Oh, you're okay, Grant, go ahead. Yeah, just one of the unique features is I think forward to this May event. Um, and I, your comments led me to conclude that this is a way to perhaps showcase our rough cut gem that is being molded right now in the uptown. Um, because I think there's going to be a lot of information available that will say, here's where we're at and here's where we're going to be in another year, which will drive some interest, not only in the future event, but also to the attendees wanting to come back to Marion in the spring, in the spring of 2023. So it, it, the, the point is, it's, I think it, it's a way to showcase what we're trying to do. To that end, however, we're going to be mid-flight on um, phase two of the project uptown. And I guess I get the question is, um, are we planning to have some long range planning and coordination with engineering, public services, everybody else parks in order to make sure that all known impediments because of construction are being factored in to the events execution. That we we absolutely know that there will be challenges, not just to the festival, but also to the half marathon and 5K, which which are returning this year after an absence of oh okay. well, it might have been 2017, uh, and 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 we accept those. Uh, I agree that this is an opportunity to. Uh, just lay that lay all that out for people so that that again construction is not an impediment and and we're asking for funding for those additional four pages because the 12 pager uh, we usually produce is just jam packed with every other piece of information that we need for people to know from sponsors uh, festival programming a spread of uh, images from all the artists that those 12 pages are uh, fully utilized and to do what it is that we want to do, uh, we do need additional space and the additional space will cost sure. as it should. I, I, um, just to add, we, we've yeah. been in constant contact with Mike Barcolo and Jake from a logistical perspective to make sure that we know like best case scenario and worst case scenario of where we might be on any given construction. And we're being really conservative and and having a plan for if we're worst case scenario and the sidewalks closed on 10th street or, and whatever we've got, to, we're going to have that planned out. Okay. And, and, and with regard to the, uh, the footprint of the park, that the worst case scenario is still very workable. <laughs> and, and, and we have a plan to utilize all the space available to us. And so we know how that will work. Uh, it's not optimal. Um, we think that people will, that, that we're building it and we think people will come and we want to sort of burst forth with the advertising, not just to remind people of what a good time they've had previously, uh, but, but also to celebrate the 30th annual event, even though it's, uh, uh, it's, it will be a different configuration than people are used to. We, we still wanna celebrate this milestone. Um, and again, attract as many people as possible so they will then return because they've seen the changes, they know what's happening, they know what's coming up. I mean, the restaurants alone, that, that if this is an opportunity to get that information out, we really wanna take it. I'll add to that, Deb, that our retailers, um, they consider, they, they um, compared this day right up there with Christmas. It's a very busy day in Uptown Marion. It drives a lot of sales coming out of what's usually a very soft time for retailers um, coming out of, you know, the, uh, the winter months and going into spring. It's a nice springboard for our reach, our retailers and our restaurant owners. And we're, we're really grateful for the opportunity to close 7th Avenue, which has never been an option to, to eliminate any boundary that the park may have seemed to set just to drive people's appetites uptown and again embrace 
in, embrace Uptown as the food court. And it's exciting to hear about their plans as to how they will serve that audience. Um, I just, I just, I'm just really grateful that we can do that because the whole thing is about bringing people uptown that, I mean, we tell the artists, yeah, 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 this is for you, but I mean, it's not <laughs> that it's for the community, that that's why we do it, that that's why the community dollars come into it. I think that that, think whole, that whole new that dimension sentence. of that whole new dimension of having all these options for food vendors uptown now that we didn't have in the past, yeah. that you don't even need food, food vendors because you have the restaurants and the, and the, 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 the vendors who are here, um, I think that adds a whole new dimension. And like you said, um, being able to make the entire uptown the festival site is really an exciting uh, thing that's taking this signature event to a whole new level. So, yeah, and so. I think being able to close 7th Avenue is a game changer. That eliminates the barrier to people crossing the street. They cross the street anyway, but now we're bringing the festival that much closer. I think it's going to be a really cool um, cool feel to the festival. And, and we plan to develop some programming for the street to bring people halfway there so that they will make the leap into uptown. So it will not be it, 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 it will not be a barren border that we are planning to attract people into that space. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's do it. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Jill. Deb. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. On the consent agenda, the first item that's marked is item A6. Are there any items prior to A6 that any council members have questions on or would like to discuss individually? Okay, then. A6, just handling that. Yes, Your Honor. So what I wanted to do is draw attention to um, the payments that are in there. Um, as you may recall, there was an email memo that was sent from the city attorney back in November um, that those projects that instead of bringing a council memo and a council resolution for every payment, um, they're already in the schedule of bills. And so with the resolution accepting the contract, whether that's a contract for engineering services or a contract with Rachi Construction or any other contractor for a project, um, those will show up in the accounts payable invoice report, which they were there before, but there won't be a separate memo and resolution. So I just wanted to specifically draw your attention to that. There's two payments on the schedule of bills. One is on page 20 and one is on page 23. One is a payment to Rachi Construction for Third Avenue and one is uh, on page 23, and it's a payment to Vinster and Kim for the Indian Creek Trunk Sewer Design Segment 11. Um, so again, this is part of the strap plan for effective and efficient government. So we're eliminating additional work that staff needs to do. Um, and so with that, uh, we wanna make sure that this information though is still communicated out. So in that memo before, city council and the public would see a percent of project complete and how much we've paid. And so instead, if it's gonna be a project that's $1 million or more, we'll make sure to highlight that in the engineering newsletter. And then depending on the project, um, so for example, 7th Avenue has its own email that goes out that has specific updates. Some of those smaller projects like the sidewalk ramp project, that's only $100,000, we won't really bring that one up. But if there are certain projects that as we go through them that city council wants to have highlighted that we're doing, even though it's a lower dollar amount, please that bring that up to staff so that we can make sure that we put it in the engineering newsletter or whatever social media so that that information is still being put out there that was originally in the memo that is not being created now. Um, there is talk of the dashboard that we've started that discussion, um, but it's not built yet. So we're kind of in that interim process. So you're still going to see some payments that have a memo and a resolution because we didn't have that initial language in the resolution. But some of them you're going to start just seeing in this. And when this is 25 pages, I know you, maybe you don't have a chance to look at each one. I know that that's associated with a certain project. So just want to draw your attention to it as part of the strap plan. Go ahead, Grant. 
Yeah, Mike, I, I appreciate the objective of this to, to simplify um, what we're doing and how we're managing it. Um, it Maybe as a interim step, as we move into this new process in this schedule of payments, I guess uh, that Lisa runs, would it be possible somehow for those that might uh, be subject to the, um, this new approach just to be highlighted or marked or somehow. So if we if we are scanning it, we can see that this is an interim uh, or uh, yeah, an interim payment, if you get what I'm trying to say, or is yeah. that not is that undoing the efficiency of what you're trying to achieve? I'm going I would have to check with the finance, but I'm guessing it would have to be something manual. But it's something that if, if city council feels that they that you want that mark, that's something that could likely be done. But I, I would assume it has to be manual. I hate to admit that I scan this every so often. And I, I don't know if it makes sense to, maybe I'm the only one that has that need. So I would just defer to whatever decision you make relative to maintaining uh, efficiency in the overall process you're trying to achieve. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions or comments on this? Okay. All right. Um, the rest of the consent agenda through E, I believe E30, uh, not, no items are marked for discussion by staff. Are there any items anyone had questions on for A7 through E30? Anything? Okay, E31 then? Yes, Your Honor. So E31 is an MOU with the local 231 of the AFSME um, regarding the base wages for the right-of-way technician and the environmental specialist. Um, these are two jobs that were approved in last year's budget um, with some turnover that we had and uh, finding a new city manager. This got put on the back burner. So now we're finally getting to it. Questions? E32. E32, um, for those that don't know, our wonderful SUDAS manuals. Um, so this is our specification manual and our design manual. Um, if you need some light reading uh, to put you to sleep. Um, so basically the design manual is how to engineer things versus the specifications manual is how do you build it. Um, so this is our um, Bible that we use to uh, keep the contractors in line. So every year there's a new update that comes out and your packet was a summary of those changes. They're all fairly minor. I think there was two chapters that were completely rewritten. One was the right of way trees and the soils for plantings and parks department has reviewed those. Um, with that, uh, we do a supplemental specification. So there's certain things that the city of Marion wants that not necessarily every municipality in the state wants. For example, fire hydrants, we buy all our fire hydrants and they have to get the fire hydrant from the water department. That way we don't have 20 different couplers for when we have a response. So the fire department has one coupler, they hook up to that fire hydrant and we make sure it's consistent. Same thing with things like lights and other proprietary things. Um, so this is just our annual update to SUDAS. And like, if, you're, if you want me to, I can read it the entire books to you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, go ahead, Grant, and then Steve. So, Mike, I, I understand why these get updated on an annual basis and why we've elected to conform with them. I mean, it's just the right thing to do um, from multiple perspectives. I guess the question is, do you ever find that revisions being made to the SUDAS uh, cause us to incur additional costs, or is it more an impact on our engineering and design techniques? Um, I've never seen anything that directly adds to a cost. So just so you know, if, if there's changes and we've made suggestions before, is basically there's regional areas that have meetings that are set up by the DOT um, where we bring up, we would like X, Y, and Z change in the specification. Um, that directive then goes to others to see if the rest of the state is wanting that or not. It goes to votes, um, but it actually helps to make sure that a new product that someone's trying to sell is a proved product before we just put it in. 
Um, so something like asbestos pipe is not approved to start putting asbestos pipe in. Okay, all right. But really it's not a cost driver to us. No, if anything, it's a cost saver because for the most part, we're following what the state's doing. So it's more consistent versus before when we were on the Cedar Rapids Metro specs, that was only Cedar Rapids projects versus everyone else in the state was using SUDAS. Right, okay, thanks. Yeah, my, my question isn't directly related, but I was gonna ask it after the session. But my question is like with the old Y site, it's not on the building side, but on a demolition side where they have to separate, right now they're separating the concrete and block from the re-rod and the iron. So is that a state requirement or where does that require, is that a requirement for them to do that or is that just being done for efficiency? So I'm just curious as to that, if that's a, that I'm not sure. that kind of yeah. separation. I don't know if there would be possibility of asbestos or contamination in one material versus the other. Sometimes they separate materials because they can sell certain materials versus not sell others. But so it's not a requirement for them to do that. Not that I'm aware of. So they could, if they want to, they could just take that entire pile with concrete and rewrite it and everything and just haul that out to the landfill without having to separate it. So, so from the demolition standpoint, they're doing that of their own volition then, right? As far as I know, yeah. I mean, the, the concrete, if they're keeping it separate, could be something where a farmer wants it to stabilize streams. I mean, there's there's multiple uses for that. So there, there's usually a reason behind it. They don't do it just for the fun of it. That was my question. Was it a requirement or was it something they're doing? They're actually grinding it all up. You know, as yeah, far and as so the then they're likely using so it for sub-base. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on this item? E32. Okay. 33 and 34 are not marked. Any questions on those? 35. So 35 is the engineering work program. So that in your packet, there should have been the, uh, the word version, the 10 pages long of all the projects that engineering is going to work on. And then there's the Excel that was converted into a PDF that actually assigns individual staff to the projects. Um, and it look, should look familiar for those that get the engineering newsletter. This is the basis for it. And then this will um, become the, the email that goes and sends out to the, I don't know how, how many thousands of people we have signed up for it. And then we update it as we go. So if there's any specific questions on any projects, I'd be willing to take those. Questions? Go ahead. Are you going to um, be asking council members to go drive the roads and do another uh, pavement condition index rating activity? Um, so the numbers that we have for that, um, that will be part of the budget discussion, the CIP discussion, because that is really a matter of uh, based on the PCI value that council has established. Are you willing to thus find the money to pay to get that PCI value? Okay. Okay. So we're beyond our becoming acquainted with the pavement condition indexing. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Other questions on E35. Okay. Uh, any questions on the remainder of the consent agenda? Including E1 on the Second part of the consent agenda. Any questions on E1? Okay, regular agenda B1. Is that Mr. Miller? <clears throat> this time I got you on the right on the right Perfect. agenda item. We're good. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor and Council. Uh, second reading for the proposed uh, sanitary sewer interim rate increase. Uh, again, last time we alluded to the fact that we're recommending this rate increase to get ahead of future rate increases that are associated with the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, as stated in the weekly newsletter, um, uh, Marion staff met with Cedar Rapids representatives to talk on a number of issues. Uh, one was the um, fiscal year 23 proposed rate increases. You got a copy of that. And then we also discuss briefly the future plans for the uh, wastewater treatment plant, their long-term capital uh, improvement project, as well as schedules. Now, 
as of right now, the information we got is pretty limited. Um, we do not have any information on the long-term plans, nor do we have a budgetary figure or a schedule. Yet they are asking us to move forward with an agreement by July. So that's where that sits. So there's a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, internally, we discussed this as, as a staff. We had some new fees that we're looking at. One of them is that sanitary sewer connection fee, if you recall. Tom has been working on that. And I'll let Tom kind of speak to that, but we're going to make the recommendation to kind of put that on hold because we want to take a look at all of this um, in, in one picture and then come up with a new plan uh, moving forward. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Yeah, I just, I just uh, uh, to continue that, yeah, I think at the last meeting I'd indicated we'd bring back that conversation based on the information that we have. I think it's best that we take a look at this holistically. Um, I was not only it's not that I was I am scheduled tomorrow to speak at the Home Builders Association their developers council I was going to bring I was going to discuss this issue specifically and talk to the point of the sanitary sewer fee but based on this information I'll go and just just relay the information that we're going to be on that 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 fee will be on hold until further notice um, and continue to communicate with that group as we move along in these conversations so Questions? Okay. Oh. Go ahead. If there's questions. Are there yeah, questions at this point? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Just so the council's aware, Amber was be able to put something out on the website, and then we'll have something that the Marion Messenger prepared in regards to information on these rate increases. So all of that will be communicated out to the public. So okay. Is that all good with everyone? Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, so Ryan, this is just a this is an interim adjustment, an increase yeah. in anticipation to others that we anticipate are coming, but we don't have visibility into those. From we do. You were afforded that information. So um, this is an interim rate adjustment to address kind of shortcomings in this fiscal year. Next fiscal year, we're we're looking at a very large increase, a very large increase, probably seven times this. And so that is a lot. Um, we're trying to get our trying to get information on that right now. Um, we do have meetings scheduled with some uh, consultants to come in, help us take a look at that. That's this Friday. Um, but as we move along in the budget process, we'll have more information for you. Right. But uh, the, the goal right now is to digest the information, give you accurate information as we go. So I also just want to remind city council that we do have the HDR study that we did that had $83 million worth of sanitary sewer improvements that we need to do as well. Um, so again, this is just interim at this point. ARPA will obviously help with some of that depending on what we get from Lynn County and the future ARPA discussion we have later today, but that's a lot of money to spend. Well, so in reading the uh, information that was sent the other day, it made me wonder how much it would cost for Marion to build a wastewater treatment plant. Got an idea in your head? That's a great question. That's part of the due diligence that we're going to do as a staff um, and make sure that we have some accurate information so you can make some informed decisions. It's half a million a month, almost half a million. Was it 450? I mean, that's that's a lot. That, that's before <laughs> our share of the capital improvements down at the plant. Hmm. We did convey, we did convey to the officials at Cedar Rapids when we met on Friday that um, the the size of the increase uh, was fairly large and did take us off guard. Be interesting to hear the answer to that question in the future. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right, under engineering E1. Thanks, Ryan. Kara, I believe you're gonna take this one. Yes, this is actually me, Your Honor. Um, we wanted to be sure we, we touched base on this just so there's no confusion with the last, um, the last <clears throat> slide and this slide. This is not relating to the connection fees at all. This is simply about a technical requirement for the connection. 
Currently, our code says that you're required to connect if it's within 250 feet of the property line. Whereas what the state code and Lynn County do is they actually measure from the building or the proposed building. And so we're just matching our code to theirs. So this would be in a case where we have a county subdivision that we've annexed into the city. They're on an ex existing septic system and Lynn County has established that their septic system has failed. And so whether or not they tie into city sewer or not. Okay, is that clear to everyone? Anyone have questions or concerns about that? Okay, thank you. Community development, the first item is not marked. Any questions? Okay, F2. And for this item, I'm gonna turn over the gavel to Mayor Pro Tem. Tom, is that you? Yeah, so on Thursday, there's gonna be a public hearing regarding the proposed annexation of property uh, located uh, uh, north on Albernet Road, just west of Oak Ridge School. Um, uh, by Kent Bakken. Um, as you'll recall, a few months back, we had a conversation about the annexation proposal. There were three properties included. Uh, we had a voluntary petition from two of the properties, and then there was one person uh, that was included in this. It was uh, not a voluntary application, so we consider that a non-consenting uh, <coughs> uh, owner included into the annexation. The city's allowed to do that. Um, to square up our boundaries, which is one of the provisions within the state code that we try to do is not have jagged boundaries. So you can see the, the map illustrates the property owner in purple, that is a non-consenting owner. Um, we're allowed to include up to 20% of a annexation as non-consenting, that one individual is, is less than the 20, so it's provided for in state code. Um, uh, staff's reviewed it and recommending approval. We've done all the appropriate postings and such and, and would recommend that we move forward with this on Thursday after the public hearing. Any questions for Tom? All right. And the next one's also a question on the next one. And I guess it goes with the F2, so I'll turn the uh, meeting back to the mayor. All right, thanks. All right, uh, next on the agenda is a series of uh, presentations and discussions. So we'll start with number one, presentation regarding the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Chief, welcome. Yes, Your Honor, we're going to actually be doing number five first. <laughs> oh, <laughs> since okay. there... I was wondering why you were, gonna, you were up here. Uh, well, since there one. is a Lynn County EMA meeting this evening, um, I wanted right. to be sure to get this in. So um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, say to Mr. Harper, I said that the Marion Arts Festival might be a good opportunity for us to do our first incident action plan to make sure there, if there are any issues, we can take care of those. So I will look into that. Um, but I wanted to take this opportunity to brief the council and the public um, about our need for the emergency operations plan. Um, as you all are, all are aware, and I've made it very clear many times that our emergency plan is out of date. So it, during the derecho, it was assumed by many entities of what the other agency was going to do. There were assumptions about what Lynn County Emergency Management does. There were assumptions about the state and what their Department of Homeland Security does and the federal government. <clears throat> well, all of that was actually not correct. And that was all of Lynn County that was inaccurate in what they thought and how they thought it should work. So what we need to do is <laughs> we need to do a unilateral promulgation of an EOP which is necessary for each city in Lynn County for their initial response to the disaster before requesting assistance through County EMA. So in other words, we need to individually, each city adopt our own emergency plan document, which cites the legal basis for the EOP. 
So this is going to be a drawn out process is what I'm trying to warn you about. <laughs> so we're going to begin. Uh, so our first step is going to be for the city council to please attend the uh, um, EMA training that's going to be offered on February 12th at 8.30 and it goes till 12.30. Um, this process, it will be done by Steve O'Connick, the director of EMA. He wants all Lynn County agencies to be involved with this. So it's not just Marion, um, it's all jurisdictions so that they understand how the EOP needs to be developed in each of their cities, including in the county and how we all work together. So I won't go into that because hopefully you'll attend the class and you'll learn about that. But um, if you can't attend, they do plan on maybe having another one. So we'll see about if we can have an additional one for those that can't attend. So I just wanna reemphasize to all of you how important this is. And it's really important for all of you to understand the process. So I encourage you all to please take part. Do you know and if that's uh, I'm here person? for any questions. Is that in person or virtual? Uh, it's in person, but I will talk to him tonight to see about it being virtual too. I could do both. Okay. Because uh, that, they are limiting uh, the class for 30 people. Um, and that's due to distancing. Yeah. So it's possible that it could be virtual. I'll check with him. Okay. It's kind of a long period for virtual, so I'm not sure. <laughs> but we'll see what we can do. So are there any questions? This is just the beginning of the process, but you're wearing for a long haul. Steve and then Randy. Yeah, just a real quick question, Deb. I've got it on my calendar, but I don't have where yet. Oh, Lynn County Emergency Management at Kirkwood College. I'll, Kirkwood. I'll send that out to you. Okay, thank you. Right back, yep. Okay. Any other questions? Randy and then. Okay. Chief, the, uh, the, the, this meeting here, the um, <clears throat> date that you, that's currently set right now, is that then for an understanding of how the EOP is gonna work as an overall draft for all municipalities then? And then everybody will go back and draft their own EOP or can you just, outline that just a little bit as to what that first meeting will be about? Yeah, please. According to state and federal laws, um, the um, acts that have been um, adopted by Congress, each jurisdiction is responsible for their own emergency plan. Each jurisdiction must protect their uh, public, the protect the public and respond to the public in a disaster on their own before resources can come, which is, that's natural. I mean, it's gonna take a while for other resources to respond. So each community has to respond. The initial response, we are responsible for. And so we have to have a plan on how we are gonna to respond to different scenarios and show that we can respond to those scenarios. And that's for future federal funding, future state funding. We have to show our plan that we will do that. Okay, thank you. So this initial meeting will be the collaborative overlay for everybody in Lynn County yes. um, with respect to what each community will actually do on the underlying of that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Identifying all the, the responsibilities of the various jurisdictions. Especially the elected officials. What's expected from each jurisdiction. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm good at this point here. Mary. Oh, okay. Anyone else? Thank you. All right, thanks, Chief. We might be finished in time so I can see you at that meeting. Okay, back to number one, presentation for on the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Is that ML? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, today, uh, <clears throat> we're looking for council direction on uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, funding allocations. Uh, as you know, um, the ARPA funding is part of a 1.9 trillion uh, economic development uh, economic stimulus uh, that was passed into law uh, on March 11th. Um, 350 billion of that was set aside 
uh, to uh, as a program uh, to um, help states and local governments with uh, recovery from COVID-19 and, and also to stabilize the economy. And um, Marion is not an entitled city like uh, City of Rabbits, uh, meaning uh, we don't get direct uh, allocation from the uh, federal government. Uh, however, we do get uh, our uh, grant funneled through the state government. So uh, we applied for the grant and um, we received the first installment last year and we're uh, expecting the second installment to be um, received uh, around uh, July or August of 22. Next slide. Uh, we're expecting or we're eligible for $6 million. Um, to put it in perspective, um, Lynn County is receiving $44 million. Uh, Cedar Rabbits will be receiving $28 million and Hiawatha $1.1 million. Um, uh, the way that fund is uh, distributed or allocated is based on the formula. So, and according to the uh, interim final rule that was released by the US Treasury uh, Department uh, last year, uh, those funds will, ha uh, will have to be obligated by December of 2024 and uh, would be spent by December of 2026. Next slide. And I, I should say that the final rule is out and it was approved on January 6, and it will be uh, taking effect uh, April 1st. Uh, so any spending that is happening in between will be uh, or should be in compliance with the interim rule. And um, the eligible use categories we're looking at are going to be under the eligibility of public health and economic uh, response um, use category, and also would be under water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. Uh, the final rule clarified uh, more in depth of those use categories and expanded uh, into them uh, and added more flexibility. And uh, before we dive into the planning process, uh, we had four main goals. Next slide. That we discussed previously with council. And those are, uh, we want to ma maximize the impact of those funds. And we want to, uh, as much as we can, leverage partnerships and outside funding also to maximize the impact. And also we wanted to avoid duplication with other relief programs. Uh, if, if a program is offered uh, by the county or the state, uh, we, of course, we will be, because we wanna uh, maximize the impact to the community. We don't wanna duplicate those um, uh, relief programs. And also we wanted to minimize the administrative burden of course, those uh, federal funds come with uh, guidelines and compliance and um, added administrative uh, cost. So overall, to maximize our um, use of those funds, we want to minimize those administrative costs. Next slide. So our planning process included uh, us uh, seeking community input on how those funds can be used. Uh, so we uh, put out a survey to our community listing out all the uh, eligible or possible use categories um, to the community and asked the responders uh, to uh, rate the importance of those use categories to them. Um, results came back and all of those uh, use categories uh, received um, a significant support. Um, uh, those categories were 
uh, water uh, used for water infrastructure improvements and uh, used for sanitary sewer infrastructure uh, um, assistance to nonprofit and impacted un uh, industries, um, housing assistance and uh, uh, improvements to the transit service. Um, you can see uh, percentages, uh, those uh, represent uh, percent uh, in support or uh, see the use as uh, an important use for those fund. Um, next slide, Terrell. <clears throat> Taking into account or in consideration our community input and uh, our own staff assessments uh, for needs, we came up with four uh, recommended allocations and all to support uh, long-term uh, growth and opportunity and also to uh, help or assist uh, households uh, struggling with the economic impact of COVID. Um, we are proposing uh, allocating 1.4 million to go towards uh, sanitary sewer improvements. 4 and- Is it 4.1 or 1.4? 4.1. Yeah, I think you said 1.4. So <laughs> Sorry. Just making it clear. Yeah. 4.1 million to go towards uh, sanitary sewer improvements. And as we presented to you before, uh, our need uh, represented with um, uh, an outcome of a model that HDR done for us uh, came to be around 83 million uh, will be needed. Um, to accommodate our 2040 growth. And uh, water infrastructure improvements, uh, 600,000. Um, those to improve uh, water mains uh, in the old residential areas of town. And according to water general manager, that would give us around uh, a mile of improvements. And then also we're recommending uh, dedicating a million dollar for affordable housing assistance uh, programs. Um, those would be a housing rehab program um, uh, and an immediate assistance housing program and uh, land acquisition for uh, low to moderate income housing development. Um, Community Development Director can expand on those uh, if you have any questions. And, and uh, dedicating uh, 300,000 to uh, transit service improvement that would come as um, capital um, infrastructure acquisition. Next slide. <clears throat> So this slide uh, shows uh, sewer projects four and five that we presented uh, previously as part of our application to Lynn County ARPA funding. And next slide. Also a project um, included in here, um, a, a, a giant uh, infil infiltration and inflow reduction uh, also uh, would be taking care of uh, um, our sewer system in the old uh, area of town. And uh, Christopher Creek uh, project, uh, that's also a transfer improvement. Next slide. This slide shows those allocations in a pie chart format. You can see uh, those um, uh, allocations in percentages or in comparison. So we're looking for uh, direction from council on those uh, use categories as well as uh, allocation or dedicated amount. Slide, yes. This a slide presents uh, our timeline. Um, if we receive um, approval or go ahead uh, from council, we'll be incorporating um, uh, this plan into our budget and we'll be presenting council with uh, a spending plan to be approved. 
I'll take any question if you have any. Questions? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Amal, if you, one of the earlier slides talked about the different areas and how this money can be spent. Uh, the third one was talking about premium pay for essential workers. Uh, can, and you do not have any money earmarked for that. Can you explain exactly what that category means and why there would be no money allocated towards that? Uh, I believe uh, we have not had any additional uh, staffing cost uh, because of uh, COVID response. That would be staff responding to uh, COVID would be fire and police. And I, I don't believe we have any cost like that. And uh, the other public sector uh, um, use category is related to loss of revenue. And we, when the interim rule came out and we did uh, review uh, our revenues based on the template that they provided, uh, we could not um, establish a, a, a significant loss in revenue uh, that would make us eligible for those use categories. And if I recall, uh, and again, I, I look at what's in the paper, Cedar Rapids has, and I think Johnson County as well, and Lynn County have basically reached out to groups and said, and asked for a request for their how to spend or request for some of the uh, American Rescue dollars that the city and the county have. So they've essentially had a lot more requests than what they have money for. Uh, we're kind of doing it the opposite way. We're saying, here's how we're going to spend it instead of going out and saying, are there groups out there that may have requests? So is that a direction we're going to consider doing? Or is this push out the direction versus a request in direction, if you understand what I'm going after? Uh, yes, uh, because we're limited on the eligible uh, projects or use categories, we presented those ahead to, uh, ahead of time to the community to uh, because we saw a need in each category. Uh, so we wanted to assess the importance of those categories. If, for example, if one category doesn't receive a lot of support, we will not be recommending allocating uh, money for that project or so a use category. Is it fair to say that Cedar Rapids and Lynn County, because of the amount of dollars they have and how they came in, have a lot more latitude or flexibility? on how those dollars can be spent. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, they, they, they're, yes, they have a broader, and also they have well-established programs. Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just a couple points. Um, that's where we get into the difference with entitlement communities versus non-entitlement communities. Okay. So if you're an entitlement community, you receive the funds directly from the federal government and you are obligated then to disperse them out to, to other civic partners. It's, it's not just something that, so your operating departments would have to come in and compete for those. As a non-entitlement entity uh, the, that we are, we are getting our proportionate share to distribute as the council sees fit. Um, again, I'm fairly new to the organization. My understanding um, is that the reason that the, the city did the, the uh, community survey was to ascertain the community need and how would the community like to uh, have, the, have our organization allocate those dollars as a way to engage the public. Um, the, the recommendation here is just based off of taking staff's review of the, that data. If the city council would like us to look at other opportunities or, or uh, reach out to other civic organizations in a manner that uh, you would see the entitlement communities do that, we can certainly look at that. We wanted to present this to you as recommendations to get your feedback, get your direction. So if there's something up here that you would like us to explore a little further, uh, we're happy to do that. I think what Amal said is true in that, you know, a city like Cedar Rapids has a lot of those the organizations. That we don't have those organizations in, in the city that could, could put these funds to use, really. Uh, we don't have that infrastructure in the, in the, in the community. 
for example, if we wanted to provide assistance to local businesses, we'll have to create a program. Uh, you can see the housing programs we're proposing here are going to be in partnership with the uh, Central and East uh, Iowa Council of Government because they're established and they'll take care of the administrative burden of that. And I, 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 I love that. I don't think I, I like it all. I think that element, I think, is really, and, and I, I'm really happy to see the amount that's recommended into that program, um, especially the rehab uh, uh, portion of it. I think it's, we want to really preserve and preserve our, our affordable housing stock in the city where you know everything being built new is, is expensive. Um, helping people to invest into the existing homes in the older parts of town and keep those up, um, I think is a really smart way of maintaining a good stock of quality, um, affordable housing, so. And we intentionally try to diversify those programs so you can see a long-term, uh, like uh, the improvements we have and also the acute need of providing immediate assistance and, and also leveraging outside funding uh, with the MATCH program. Okay, so uh, Colette and then Tom has a question, a, a comment. Um, just to, could you go back to what the citizens responded with again, what that slide has on it? So can, it looks like we're doing something in response to water and sanitary and housing and transit. Is there something that we've aligned regarding nonprofit and impacted industry assistance? As that's number three on the list of community input. Uh, for one, we don't have an established program. And also I believe that the state is providing uh, assistance to local businesses um, they can tap into. Did that answer your question? Not really, but I'm going to wait for the rest of the conversation, okay. then I'll circle back around. So we have Tom waiting to comment, and then anybody else? Will have Will? Okay, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, what well, I just wanted to point out that one of the there's there's a lot of money flowing into the region from between Lynn County and the Cedar Rapids and and Marion, and, and each community kind of has um, the buckets of money that are out there. Um, one of the nice things is, is we were able to look and see where some of these other dollars are coming from and going to so for instance uh assistance to uh folks that can't pay rent well lynn county dedicated i, I believe a, a million dollars of their funding to that program so <clears throat> doubling down on that program you know unless there was a really significant need uh doesn't seem to make sense so let's diversify that so you know from the housing perspective reaching out to ECOG, which is a nonprofit, to, to provide some alignment. They can administer the programs. They're also administering the patch program. Um, so dollars are coming in from Lynn County uh, to that program uh, at ECOG, and they're already assisting Marion homeowners. Um, so we do have uh, a part of the LM or the rehab program is providing a match to a Lynn County program for Marion homeowners. Uh, that if they get, uh, if their project is submitted, they could, they could get the same amount of money that we're proposing for a rehab program. So we're trying to take the dollars that could come to Marion and, and make them all equalized and, and use the nonprofit agencies to provide the assistance in the community where we can. I don't think that came out as smoothly as it thought it did in my mm -hmm. mind, but um, uh, the housing part of it, uh, we're, we're really trying to partner with ECOG, who's kind of been the um, the filter through for all the housing dollars. So they're doing the patch program. They're doing the assistance, uh, rent assistance as well. Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't know. I just wanted to let you know that we are working, you know, with the, with the nonprofit organizations to secure some of that funding and ensure that we're kind of being able to tap all different pieces of it. Okay. So Will and then Grant, and then we can come back to Colette if you have a, okay. I have a couple questions. Uh, the three hundred thousand for transit. Can you explain what that would be for? Since we don't have transit. Yeah. <laughs> the um, so th this is going to be relevant to the um, 
presentation and direction regarding Marion Transit. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to give a lot of information, uh, and seek a lot of direction from the council. So the reason for the 300,000, as you'll see in the next presentation, this is a continuation of a conversation that I, uh, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, began in November where council directed staff to work with horizons and look at alternative, um, transit, uh, models. Um, and this is, we've also received um, another increase from Cedar Rapids uh, request as it relates to the transit. So uh, this ties into the next presentation where we would be required to provide upfront capital for the bus system on a point to point. So this would, this would be based on council's direction of the following item. So that's the, the 300,000. And if the rules, if the final rules, um, do not allow for us to use the transit, what we would, and council's okay with the funding, one of the things that we would talk about is, is there a way that we can use additional um, local option sales tax? Correct. Local option sales tax to the tune of 300,000 for the buses, and then use this for the additional eligible expense for uh, water sewer. Again, a lot of this is hinging on council direction and feedback on these items. Thank you. Um, the other question, so the sewer projects, you said four and five that were also in the application to Lynn County. So if Lynn County approves that application and we give money for four and five, we're gonna have that money still sitting there to do something with, correct? Or do you have alternates? Correct, so four and five was applied to Lynn County. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Terrell, Christopher Creek was not applied for. So, that these was would be so those are all alternates that gotcha. could be done. Again, so we have $83 million worth of sanitary sewer projects. I won't have a problem finding a place to spend right. no, them. No, no, I understand. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to, because I mean, it was 4.1 million for, for sewer and then 0. 0.6 for water. We've got a lot of water infrastructure that needs upgrading also. So my thought was, well, if the the four and five gets the money from Lynn County when well, there's there other projects for, for water that can also be have money go towards. So the I and I project alone is over 8 million. So we believe there is so much need and also uh, why we put this uh, project in there, because it's going to help with our flow as well, reducing the, the monthly uh, bill we pay zero rabbits. So that is, uh, sealing out our system to block uh, rainwater, for example, from getting in because we get charged by the flow. And that's what the third option? Uh, the, the, the one with the pink area. This is over 8 million and it's, uh, it's going to help the overall system uh, performance. Good. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there, um, well, first off, could we go back to the community response slide that showed kind of, yeah, thank you. Um, relative to number three, we're not at this point allocating any dollars to that, but I, I got to wondering, is there a regional coordinating group kind of like the ECI COG that could help, I guess, interface any contribution that we would make to number three, um, align well with other contributions coming in from other jurisdictions. We can do that research. I, I guess what I would just, my, my sensitivity here is there was a, a strong response for that and from the community. And um, it seems to me we ought to investigate then based on that strength of response, how to figure out a mechanism to do it. But I'm also sensitive to what Amal said. We don't, we don't on a, uh, within the city, have our own program to do that. So I guess the question is, can we leverage another group to help us? Thank you. That was my, I guess, my question. Well, do you have a follow-up? No, I think the response to his question will answer my question. Perfect. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Good See? thing I waited. See, I knew. <laughs> yeah. So I, I came here this afternoon, not knowing exactly what your recommendation was going to be for these dollars. So I'm sitting at home and thinking, 
what could be used for it. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know all the programs or all the needs that might be out there. I think of our, our city motto of reach higher. And that's kind of where I was at a little bit more so than what this is representing. And so the thought I had when I sat at home today was how much should be going for sewer and water and how much should be going for other. And I kind of came up with our 70-30 split on the one cent sales tax option, local sales tax option. That would make a million eight instead of a million three that you have. Uh, and I think so, there's nothing wrong with what you came up with. I'm just presenting at least what my thought process was in that I would hope we come out of this with some programs that would surprise some of our citizens and do some things that maybe were not totally expected. Sewer is expected, water is expected. Uh, the housing, I think, is great. The transit is certainly needed. But, you know, I just say, you know, Kinders, there's something more we should do or could do for community projects, more of the soft side instead of the hard side that is going into sewer and water. And I know there's a huge need for the sewer, I mean, $80 million. I understand that. Uh, we got to figure out how to manage that. But anyway, I just wanted to at least throw out my, what my thoughts have been about where the dollars, or at least the breakdown of where the dollars could go. I don't have any specifics, just saying maybe the million three could be a million eight, and we find more ways on how to help our community. Other input? Okay, do you? Your Honor, if I can just recite the direction that I've heard. Go ahead. Um, so the, the feedback regarding the recommendations is go back and, and look at and explore what opportunities there would be for that non nonprofit uh, impacted industry and see if there is any sort of uh, other entity that we can partner with to leverage those dollars. Uh, and then the, the, the second item would, do, would be to go back and look at that 70-30 split. I'll have to familiarize myself with that uh, and, and as a team and, and kind of identify possible community partners or projects that, that um, given the guidance and the guidelines from the feds that, that could be uh, applied. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'm not, I mean, I know where, I know there are restrictions. So right. there may be some thoughts and ideas out there and I certainly know based on how that is, there's a number of restrictions. Yeah. So, yeah. And if, if there are, if there's any sort of ideas um, that the elected, the elected body has that, that would help us, um, I'm certain that we can drum up some, some ideas. Um, but if there are any others that, that you have, um, that would help us. Yeah, so okay. I just wanted to ask Steve, like, do you have a, is there something in particular you were thinking of or a type of project when you said something that surprises the community or? No, I don't, you, just, you, don't, you know, okay. again, but, but what we reached out with, we did the survey. Mm -hmm. We didn't ask them for what other areas or thoughts or ideas, you know, I know we're coming up on our budget time. There may be something that'll jump out of that budget process. Okay that may say, hey, that'd be a great project for something like this. And again, I don't think we have to be decide making all these decisions today. I mean, we got plenty of time on, on when to make the decisions. So the budget process, I think would be a good opportunity as we go through that in another couple of weeks to, to talk about potential items. I'm just throwing that idea out there. Sure. I get nothing wrong with what they presented. I'm just saying, I think, you know, this is, extra money, let's do something a little extra special. That's my point. Okay. You Your it. Honor, I, I would just say that that's exactly as we were preparing this presentation and the mall had put together the responses and we coordinate as a, as a team ideas to present as a recommendation. Um, this is exactly what we were looking for was dialogue, direction, give us some feedback so we can go back and, and uh, meet your expectations. So thank you. Is there anyone who has a different thought or objects to those those two direction items? Anybody, everybody's okay with that? 
Okay. Did you have anything else to add, Emil? I was just going to add that um, under the impacted industry assistance, for example, if we want to create a program, we have to declare an industry uh, uh, impacted. For example, federally, uh, all travel and tourism industries. And uh, I, I was just thinking about what are the industries in Marion that are in need of assistance. We'll have to look at them and then declare them impacted before we can uh, dedicate any funding for. Okay. Steve, one Well, just based on a follow-up with what you just said, impacted industries, uh, can we be, I mean, is that something where we could talk about our restaurant businesses? Yes. Where all of those, we know they've all been impacted. Obviously, they're, they've got other issues trying to find people, but we know all of them were, have been significantly impacted over the last almost two years. So yep. to me, that could be a portion of that, that would be uh, maybe a good item to look at. Okay. Anything else on this topic? Real quick, Mayor, is, so on that topic with finding workforce, is workforce covered as a way to spend these funds? Is, it, is that one of the options? Workforce development, workforce would assistance, be, is that, that is, covered They're eligible, eligible. Would, uh, would be under impacted industry That's will eligible. allocate the, the the monies and it can go towards those okay. expenses i think all operations can be eligible or permissible okay anything else on this topic okay thank you good discussion Next item is the presentation uh, on transit. Is that Tom? Yep. Okay. So, uh, my apologies. So a couple months back, uh, uh, Kesha uh, presented to the, the council um, kind of the state of transit. Uh, we, we currently have Cedar Rapids Transit. We partner with them. They provide the service to the city. Um, at, at the time, we had received a letter indicating that within the next budget year, starting in July 1, that there's going to be an increase um, to, to that service to the city and that they would like us to enter into a 2080 agreement or a contractual arrangement. Uh, currently, we do, we do not have a contract with them. Um, so they, they did come to us uh, ahead of time, understanding that we're getting ready to enter budget and, and develop um, um, time frame to work into that. At the same time, uh, they had brought in uh, uh, Horizons and, and uh, Neighborhood Transportation Service uh, as an, op an option um, to, to work through with an on-demand service. And I'll say that Cedar Rapids came to us with, with Horizons and Kelsey um, from uh, Horizons is here this evening if there's specific questions as it relates to the on-demand service. Um, and Cedar Rapids indicated that this may be a better model than, than Cedar Rapids can provide or is currently providing. So currently, if you recall, we have a, a circular route. It's an hour route within the community. The, the council didn't choose to do the evening service uh, about a year or so ago, so we don't have evening service. Um, but it, annually, it costs us about $467,000. Uh, NTS currently provides that evening service, and we, we pay them uh, approximately $32,000 a year for that service. Um, Cedar Rapids is proposing an increase uh, starting in July 1, which would take that service up to about a half a million dollars, or I'm sorry, $535,000. So, um, and then we'd still need that evening service. So we're really looking at almost um, $567,000 for, for bus service starting July 1. Um, I'll, I'll, so as you recall, we brought up the on-demand service that NTS had brought uh, to the table. Cedar Rapids is currently uh, providing uh, uh, an on-demand service at the end of one of their lines, I believe. Um, uh, and so they've, they've kind of been running this program for a while. And I think NTS is both comfortable with the on-demand service. And I think Cedar Rapids is supporting that. And they may even be working uh, other areas of the community uh, on that on-demand service. Can you go to the next slide, Daryl? So from an on-demand perspective, this is an opportunity for someone could be at home, they can use their cell phone, they could use their smartphone, they can use their computer to call and schedule a pickup um, for, for service. They'd come to their door, they could get on that 
uh, bus. It wouldn't be a full size bus. It'd be a smaller bus and they could get a direct route to wherever they're going. Uh, there's an automated system upon which, you know, you can call and then they'd coordinate that activity. So it's essentially uh, an Uber for public transit. It's a, it's a completely different uh, animal. Uh, it's from what we've seen, it would be a great uh, asset to the community. Um, as you can see, riders could schedule up to two weeks in advance uh, and as little as an hour beforehand. So if you have, um, for instance, we have some work, uh, some workforce limitations. Currently, we cannot get Cedar Rapids service out to uh, Legacy or out on the east end of the business park. We've maxed out that service. If we want to add another bus to that service, it's going to almost double the cost. And, and so we're very limited on the service we have with Cedar Rapids. And Cedar Rapids has even said, we understand that that's going to be difficult for us to provide. So I, I don't think that it's, this is like a competition thing where they're saying, um, take us, take us. They're saying, hey, this is an opportunity that I think would work for you. So we've been working pretty closely with Cedar Rapids on it. Um, but there, there, like I said, there are limitations. Uh, another, another limitation is just to be able to cross a four-lane uh, highway. They need a signalized intersection. So to get to uh, the mobile home community east of 13, that they can't get out into that area because of the access and the ability to serve it, both from a time perspective, but also just from the pure ability to cross safely a four lane highway with, with access points and signalized intersections. So there's, there's a number of limitations that Cedar Rapids has. From what we're gathering from NTS, this, this service would be a tremendous increase in, in um, uh, service to our community. Um, and um, frankly, pretty excited about the opportunity. Uh, what we're here today to do is just ask for the council to give us some direction on how to proceed <coughs> Um, I think you've heard from us now twice about the on-demand service. We're, we're very comfortable with that service, but we'd, we'd like some direction from council. If there's other information that you'd like us to, to gather for you, I think it's important to go to the next slide here and we can talk about budget as mm -hmm. well. But um, um, that's, that's really why we're here today. As you can see, uh, as, from a startup perspective, there will be a higher cost to go into the NTS, but just that is primarily because we have to make some capital improvements. We like to work uh, work in a system where we would have three buses, two buses going at one time, and then the opportunity for a third to be a backup in case of uh, something happens to the, to one of the other ones, and then we'd put those on a rotation uh, for uh, uh, replacement over a period of time. So that, as 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 Ryan had indicated, uh, we were looking to the ARPA dollars to make that capital investment um, of the $300,000, which would be the three buses and then some of the startup costs. And then um, moving into operating in the future, we'd, we'd be about a half a million dollars a year in the operating. So and that would include uh, asset replacement for the buses on a rotating basis. So as you can see, we'd have much better service moving to on-demand um, and we'd have uh, probably a lower cost moving forward, considering that even as proposed then starting July 1, we'd be $50,000 more than the annual cost proposed by NTS. So really just providing a, a briefing on where we are, the information we've had, we've met with NTS, we've talked with Cedar Rapids Transit, we're moving into budget. So the question is how, how would the council like us to move forward? Um, and you know, just kind of giving you the, where we are and asking uh, direction. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer those. Grant. Yeah, Tom, so I'm going to try to summarize the model here just to clarify it in my own thinking. So in this on-demand model, it would be an NTS-based system that is operating in Marion on an on-demand basis. And the point of um, passenger delivery would be at a convenient location for them then to interface with uh, Cedar Rapids buses? So, so the current uh, transit connection between Cedar Rapids and Marion is on Twixtown Road. Right. So that would remain. Um, so if, if an individual was, and I'm going to just ask Kelsey to correct me if I'm incorrect, but um, as transit would arrive in Marion at Twixtown, they could be picked up from there and shuttled to their home to Walmart to Uptown, wherever they're choosing to go. And they just need to schedule that 
through okay. the phone, an app, or a computer. Yep. Okay. So really, then it's a in inside of Marion, it's it's a dedicated on-demand service that originates from that point of departure, or or anywhere. Okay. So I could I could be uptown. Um, I used an example. I, I I was here. I needed my oil changed. Forgot to ask for a ride to get my car picked up. You could call it and say, "Hey, I'm at City Hall. Pick me up, and I need to go to Marion." Okay. Marion Tire. So All right. I can come get you and take you there. Thanks for that uh, clarification. Is that? Uh, yep. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, and then we'll go as well. Go ahead. Um, just a couple of questions. So, did and maybe you said this, and I missed it. Is there a like what's the cost to the riders, right? So, if I'm a writer, what do I pay now versus what would I pay with the new service? I'm, would you mind if I defray? No, to Kelsey, Kelsey. Yeah, please come up. And uh, that's a great question. And when we met, probably in June, and you, uh, they were telling me about this opportunity. That was my first comment. Was, you know, in sounds great, but we want to make sure that the the cost of the end user isn't going to increase significantly because then we're kind of taking away the point of having public transportation for the people who you know who need it yeah. so yeah thank you yeah um so currently in the proposed agreement the cost would be three dollars per ride currently cedar rapids transit is free um so that would be a slight increase in that but cedar rapids transit doesn't plan to remain free and they do plan to take our pricing into consideration when they look at their future pricing arrangement to ensure that there is fair agreement. We have also already made an agreement with Cedar Rapids that even if we have a different price in Marion than they do in Cedar Rapids, we will honor fares both ways. So no one will ever pay twice for a ride, even if they transfer in and out of Cedar Rapids and Marion. So currently there is no fee, but that's with, COVID, with, that's COVID but that's related, temporary. right? Okay. Yeah, temporarily there's no fee and there will be. And so then it'll make sure that the fares coincide. The other great thing about the on-demand service is if you as a counselor or community decide that you want individuals to have free or reduced rides based on any variable, variable you choose, including income, we can very easily within 24 hours create a code that we add to individuals' accounts based on a qualification and they get a free or reduced ride based on that scenario. So it's very flexible for fair types. Okay. Second question is, uh, it sounds great, right? But I, I will share with you, I haven't used public transportation here. I think last time we talked about this, I attempted and it, it would take me a really long time to get from where I live to where I work. And yep. it was an inconvenience for me, right? I have a luxury of having mm -hmm. a car um, on demand all the time. Yes. <laughs> so um, that means, right, that I don't really understand how this would truly impact our riders, both our current riders and potentially riders that haven't used our service. I can assume, right, that mm -hmm. it sounds really good. I call, I get my ride, all those things. But so has there been any, is there any sort of indication, right? Have we talked to current riders or riders that haven't participated in our public transportation to share with us, hey, yeah, no, this is a great idea, but here are the challenges that it now presents, right? Or these were the challenges in the past, and now this new way of doing business really helps overcome those challenges. So is there any information or conversations that have happened with those folks? Yeah, so Kesha and I from the city are working on a transit survey right now to survey existing riders and kind of get their feedback. Um, the great news about NTS being a, an existing program and us having launched this exact model in an after hours kind of limited scope work basis is that we already have feedback from our riders. So we have seen if in nothing but numbers alone, the service is unbelievably successful. People love it. Um, so in the past, NTS did about 40,000 rides a year. After the pandemic, we cut down to below 20. And then since instituting the app, we are at 117% of pre-COVID ridership with the app. Like we can't hire quickly enough to keep up with the demand almost. Every time I bring on a driver, I'm hiring for another one, which is fantastic. Um, so just on the ridership of existing of NTS alone, the service is 
preventing that barrier that you just mentioned. They're not having to wait an hour or go multiple stops to go from home to work or home to the grocery store. They go door to door. It's that luxury of them having a car without the barrier of car ownership, the cost and all of those things, even the physical ability sometimes. And so it's really just creating that autonomy and a really nice space and service for people who don't have a choice. And for individuals like you who do, it actually is something that you might choose to do. I can sell my car now. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can see usership really increasing when it's not a fixed Right. line right. where you have to actually you know have the inconvenience of getting there and all that i agree i yeah. just want to check myself no, right I because those i are do great have questions. the car and i can get right i don't have to call for some odd reason so those are you. great I questions yeah. mm -hmm. so, so in, in a nutshell i want to make sure i'm understanding this so we're looking at model a which is the current cedar rapids bus with nts after hours or model b which is a new city uber bus service on demand right that's correct. Where the city is now 100% managing that through NTS. That's correct. Okay. So I understand the high level model. So now what are we talking what what are we talking about on decision timeline? Obviously there's a dollar impact. So where do we go from here because I mean I understand where we were in June, kind of maybe where we've gravitated to today. Yeah. But you mentioned the budget and the budget is in we start talking about that in two weeks. So correct. So I think we're looking for general direction from the council. If, if the on demand seems like the way to go, we would work with NTS to develop a, the program, a rollout, a conversation about that, and include it in the budget as a moving forward. Let Cedar Rapids know that we're looking to move away from them. Uh, we have talked to them. If if we did move in the direction of an on demand service and it couldn't be rolled out before July one, we could go to a month to month service. There may be a time that it's necessary to have overlap. You know, the, it, it, you don't just want to end it because the contract ends. So we would work uh, with Cedar Rapids Transit and NTS to roll it out appropriately. We just want to get some direction from the council before we start spending time going one way or the other um, um, moving forward. Well, again, personally, it sounds like it would be certainly be a better service to anybody in our community. So how does it serve somebody coming from Cedar Rapids that lives in Cedar Rapids that is working in Marion? That's a great question. So the individual would pick up, choose a pickup at the Twixtown location. So they got to get to Twixtown mm -hmm. and then that'd be the, okay, so that's the point you were making. Anybody from Cedar Rapids got to get to Twixtown, then this new service would pick them up mm -hmm. from that point. Yep. So again, it sounds like it could be a much more flexible service, certainly maybe even used more. Mm -hmm. So it comes back to, I guess, the previous slide of what is the dollar impact capital investment, and then the impact on the operating side. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go with Randy, Sarah, and then Will. Thank you. And I would just like for clarification as well too, because there's a lot of entry uh, working parts here. So what about the, the times of high demand use? Everybody needs to be at work at eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and we have limited, um, I understand that they could work that backwards, but is that a, matrix that's been worked and, and proven that we would be able to pick up and deliver at those high volume times around those um, high scheduled hours of the day, so to speak. Yeah, so that's the fantastic thing about the technology partner we use. Um, so the partner we use is VIA, um, and they are pro at their algorithms and their proprietary information on the back end. And so their, their focus point, their success point has been really making the shared ride service model as successful as possible. So that makes the service very fantastic for scenarios where you have 10 people being picked up at the same time. So currently with our existing model, we see it um, Quaker Oats, a great example, Cedar Rapids base, but forgive me. <laughs> We're just picking up, you know, 10 people getting off from a shift at the same time. And the algorithm puts them together and says, we know they're being picked up at the same time. We'll put them all on one vehicle together and we'll route their drop off accordingly. Um, so it is a shared ride service meant to optimize the number of individuals on a vehicle. And that allows for a very flexible service. That does mean that if you request a 10 o'clock pickup, you might be being picked up at 10, 15. So it is a little bit of a barrier there with just a 20 minute window. But again, that's flexible where we can kind of change and mold that system as you all see fit 
you'll have direct control over it because it will be Marion's transit. You will have ownership of it and we're a partner to help make it successful. Okay, so I'm, I'm pulling up the their, their website here yeah. to kind of get an idea for that. So that was one of my questions. So it's it's shared, the difference between an Uber and this is that you could have five people. So it's direct, but it's kind of not direct because you could be dropped, if I'm getting them to my home and Randy's getting it to his home and we're all riding, you're basically coming up into Marion and dropping those, say, five people yeah. that are in that vehicle off. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not a direct route, but it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. You could be in a vehicle with others. Yes. And then my other question um, is, it, is it all app-based? No. So we specifically made it flexible where it is largely app-based. 75% of our riders have chosen to use the app. So the utilization rate is really high for that. Um, but we still have phone booking options. Okay. And we have web-based um, tablets. We have uh, the Cedar Rapids Library. We're working on a partnership with them. And I would explore the same thing with Marion, where you could use the public computers to book the ride as well. And then, of course, phone-based, email-based as well. We try to be flexible. So individuals can book in the way that's most comfortable to them. Okay. I think about my 87-year-old father who... He can give us a call and talk to thing. us. Yes, yep. He's only going to call and talk to somebody. And then third, um, I also assume there is some way to... I think about one of the few times, I mean, when I've used public transportation, it was often in another community where I didn't have my vehicle and we figured out that system and it was, you know, your maps and even foreign countries. So is there a component to this that helps us with visitors or others to the community that may want to use this when you're not seeing buses going by, or this is my bus stop, but how they connect to that being the option if they're in our community? Yeah, that's a great question. So VIA is a partner that exists in many communities throughout the U.S. So individuals visiting from a community that already have it would have that awareness and access to it. Okay. Um, so that's in and of itself very helpful. Um, the other information on that is we can do a lot of marketing around that. So one, the vehicles will still be labeled and marked. And in fact, they'll be Marion marked vehicles. So great branding opportunity. Um, but we'll also have the opportunity with it being app-based to have QR codes, for example, that handout or that flyer for um, the arts festival that was mentioned earlier, we can just put a QR code on the back of that so people can scan and even create an arts festival promo code if you want public transit to be free that day. There's just all kinds of really neat opportunities for this to interface with supporting Marion's growth and increased demand for community projects. So to answer your question in shorter words, yes, there will be outside support for individuals from out of the community. I, I appreciate those are just a few the things that came up with in their website um, is pretty helpful in explaining their partnerships and the other ways that communities have used that, which is a, is a big question with me is where has it been successful and how do we take pieces of that on a, on a like size community? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I had a lot of questions and a lot of them got answered so far, so that's good. <laughs> but I guess I didn't realize going into this that this was replacing Cedar Rapids buses. So there will be not, no more Cedar Rapids buses coming into Marion, period. Okay, um, can we go back to the cost slide? So I just wanna clarify. So upfront, we would purchase three buses. Where would those buses, would those buses be with NTS? Yeah, we'd be able to store them at the NTS location. And then as far as drivers and maintenance and that stuff, is that all taken care of by NTS? Is that just our maintenance and operations? That's just the fee that we're gonna get charged from NTS for all that. So we don't have to have staff to run the buses or answer phone calls, nothing. Would Kesha be like the point with the city or is that gonna be you or? She's not here, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kesha has started coming to meetings. We'd have to, uh, no, we, we'd we have would, to repair we the would work. We would work through that. Obviously there's, there's a lot to work through as we, we get here. We're just trying to get some general direction moving it forward, but, but yeah, yeah, we would have a city contact for that. Um, and then you're we talking earlier about not double charging people. So if somebody, paid three dollars to get on a bus at their house get dropped off at Twixtown, then they have to get on a Cedar Rapids bus once they start charging fare Cedar Rapids said they may not charge that person again or so we would have a fair agreement so Cedar Rapids wouldn't charge them again and anyone we picked up from Tw Twixtown we wouldn't charge again so there would no be no double fees for riders is that how you would just like swap money with them like you would <laughs> how does that work for you for so if somebody comes into the system here off of paying Cedar Rapids and coming to the system 
we're able to do it in the back end. So we just code in that if they're picked up at Twixtown, they don't pay. So. But I mean, would you get paid though from Cedar Rapids for a portion of the fare they collected? Yeah, we would have a fair reciprocity That's what that means. agreement. Okay. okay. Um, and then as far as like the vehicle branding, so can I buy advertisement on the for if my that's business? That's how you want it to be set up. Absolutely. Well, so it's money. <laughs> we can make money by selling advertising on the buses, just like Cedar Rapids does. <laughs> They'll be a little bit my smaller. My big old face. My big face <laughs> on that one of the buses. 50 bucks. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Steve had a follow-up. Yeah, I, just, I was actually coming up with this, and I think where they're going to be stored was one question. But how big are these buses? How many people can be on each bus? Yep, so we haven't chosen the exact model of bus yet. My recommendation as the current operations director at NTS is that we do non-CDL required wheelchair accessible buses. Right. That way, no matter who is riding, they can get on. And so these vehicles would be 14 passenger, two wheelchair buses. So kind of like the size of a Lyft bus, but a little smaller. All right, thanks. Pull it. So just one more follow-up question and to elevate what Sarah said, I think she made a really good point about this idea of, you know, how will folks that come into our community know about this option? Um, and then as the mayor and I were chit-chatting, right, we, maybe this solves our parking issue. But on a serious note, I wonder if part of our, you know, budgeting needs to include some type of marketing to the visitors of our city, right, that this exists. So when they're visiting downtown Marion, uptown Marion rather, or they, you know, are at the arts festival, right, they know that they you don't have to be a Marion resident to know that NTS operates sort of this on-demand Uber, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, option. So I just, I just think we should consider that. I think that was insightful comment that you, a question you asked Sarah in regards to that. So it's something we should consider on our budget. Also, just to add on the VIA platform, they do have such a national reputation. Um, they're actually going public in a couple of weeks. So there's just a lot of attention around that company right now. Um, and they have, done examples of this and taken public transit to full micro transit is what they've called it. And it has put cities on the map. Um, if you look at the VIA website, there's some great case studies. One great example is Arlington, Texas. Um, it is really well regarded and discussed on a national scale now as the example of micro transit being the solution for public transit inefficiency because that's a much larger city and they went full micro transit and their ridership has exploded. It's been a really neat case study. So there's lots of great opportunities and this is a model that's existed as proven. And so we'd be bringing something in that we know could work. Do you, you foresee this being driverless vehicles in the future? <laughs> 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 to the next level. No, uh, <laughs> no, my question is, uh, can this be, can it be set up on a recurring basis? Like where I, need, I know I need to be picked up every day or whatever, twice a week or whatever at the same time. You can, so you don't, you're not calling every time or booking it every time. Yep, it can be booked up to two weeks in advance and you can do those recurrent and we have it in the system where if you want it to be permanent, if you know you go to work eight to five Monday through Friday every single week, it's just going to book you eight to five Monday through Friday every single week until you no show three times and then it'll cancel all those rides. <laughs> okay, so, oh, one more. Yes, and that made me think of my daughter getting on the bus if she's not out there in time to just leave her. Um, so the... <laughs> The costs up there, the startup cost for the maintenance and operations is the exact same as the annual cost. What's the startup cost for maintenance and operations? Um, that would be the first years, I believe, is how but, you wrote yeah, that slide. So paying a year in advance. Is that what you I mean? I think that's showing the first year and yeah. then the annual cost. Oh, year after. okay. So that would be the first year and then annual cost is the second year going forward. Okay, okay. That makes sense. I just confused on that. Thank you. City manager has a Comment. Thank you. Councilman Brandt uh, touched on some of what I was going to mention, but uh, Councilman Jensen had, had mentioned the budget process. And one of the one of the aspects about this is, uh, I don't know if it was um, highlighted well enough, but on a previous slide, the uh, proposed CRT budget uh, for FRI 23 uh, with the NTS is 567,205. So um, under this, this operating system, it'd be about $40,000 savings a year. So um, going back to the, the budget conversation and the reason for the conversation here is to get that direction that helps us then plug in a little bit, a better number in the budget that, that we'll be presenting to, uh, to everybody on the 28th. Okay, I think it's just another way that Marion can lead in the region. Any, uh, 
Okay. I know them too. Oh. One last question, Tom. I think you said several minutes ago um, this service would not go east of 13. It would. This this would this currently would. currently we go I think to 62nd Street. Oh. Um, so if you worked at Legacy, they're they're dropping off and having to walk. Right. Which is yeah. Okay. So it this this would operate east of 13 as we go that way. It's point to point anywhere in the city. Okay. All right. Thank you. If I what, can... what are the hours? So we talk about the nighttime after hours. What are the hours for the daytime? Um, the hours we proposed were 5.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And then oh. it would immediately be picked up by NTS after hours. So there would always be transit available. And the after hours is Marion. $5 a trip. Is that right? $6. Six dollars. Okay. Thank you. Tom, you had something? Yeah. I, I, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about this is if you recall, um, we, we, were, we received dollars from the, um, from the MPO for bus stops because, you know, that were there for a long time. There was a conversation about no one likes to walk or be driving and seeing people standing. And so we did apply and we received, I think, $300,000 or more for transit stops. And, you know, this is this, I mean, from the perspective of moving in this direction would also save those dollars, allow those to be programmed to actually assist with transit instead of building all of those locations over the community. So um, you can see that there's a lot of benefits to moving in this direction. I, I And I just, I think one other question I just ask, I believe we would be the first city to go fully on demand in yep. the state. Is that correct? Other cities have supplemented their public transit with micro transit, but Marion would be the first city to do 100% micro transit. <laughs> we like to be the leaders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, one more. <laughs> I'm sorry. This will be That's my okay. last one. I promise. I, I'm still I'm I'm still intrigued in understanding, and I'm concerned for the individuals. Um, who are relying on that transportation for uh, for their jobs. Mm -hmm. So they've already got a scheduled nine to three job. They know what their routes are. Um, and let's say we've got a dozen people that are needing to be picked up and they have a routine Monday through Friday process. Now we understand that there's gotta be a margin of error for time and hopefully their employers are working through this deal. But what if all of a sudden I come up and I say, I need a 12 passenger to take this organization on a field trip. And they plug themselves in the middle of this time slot that these routine people have been needing. What is there concerns for that? Or is there, again, I understand the algorithms and I love and work with algorithms, but there's also that, hey, I'm going to have a bachelor party and we're going to go bar hopping <laughs> in Marion um, Friday afternoon and starting at one o'clock. And that's going to interrupt that algorithm. What is the backup plan for that with these people that are, are, very time sensitive and rout routinely rescheduling those services? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of things we can do to prevent and solve those. One, we can limit the number of individuals that can book at one time. Okay. So we could cap the passengers at two or three or four, whatever we felt was necessary. Um, we can also um, prioritize and put in a fail safe to where anyone booking a ride to and from work, um, if we identify it as a point of work. So of course, someone who works at Walmart um, and shops at Walmart will get the same priority, but we can put in that priority to the system. And then also individuals with work rides have that reoccurring option. So reoccurring rides that they put in weeks in advance for their set, sh set schedule will always get priority. Thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, and this this for Tom. Thank you for bringing that up about the bus stops because I I thought about that and lost it. So that money for that we were getting from the M to CMPO that can be used for this, or is that only going to be used for bus stops? So we have to give it back, or no, we haven't got it yet. But we're we're working through that. Okay, so we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, what direction are you looking for, um, Ryan? <laughs> Um, I think Councilman Jensen pointed out, stick with Cedar Rapids or proceed with this, um, or if there's additional information. So proceeding needed. means that you to develop it further to come back with a proposal um, or, or, or yeah, we're definitely doing it. Yeah. <laughs> unless there's, unless there's other information piece, uh, other informational pieces or, or designs that you would like to see to help you feel more comfortable about the decision. But if you feel that you have enough 
um, enough information. We'll, we would direct, we would work on getting the proper funding in the budget and then staff would start working on the necessary documents that would need to be approved by this, this August group in effectuating this relationship. So there would be a vote at some point on a, yes, on a definite program. Yes, sir. Okay, so did you have something, Colette, and then Steve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say very much in support of this. One thing that I forgot to ask was, you said you were gonna do some type of, I think, survey, right? You and Kesha were working on a survey? Yeah, it's out. It, okay. okay, and when when would we get yes. the results of that to help with this, just to make sure, right, if something sort of interesting came back from that, we'd like to have that information. So right. I say yes, but mm -hmm. it'd be good to see those survey results. Yeah, the survey is out there now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that was my question, is, is, is there anything that may be coming out of those survey results that may impact this direction? So that's, that was just my Final question. I knew the survey was out there, but we don't have those survey results yet, do we? Correct. We do not. And what we'll do is now that we have a sense that everybody's comfortable with it, we'll start formalizing a better timeline for everybody of when we'll be bringing this information back, including the survey results and then any sort of documents that would, assuming the survey results are favorable. Yeah. Anyone object to that direction to proceed? So I think this, everybody on this side says yes. Yes? I'm okay. Great. I think you have your direction. Thank you. Good discussion. Thank you. Exciting. Okay. Um, library building project update. Welcome. Good evening. How are you, Bill? Very well, how are you all this evening? Good, and I know we have Amy here. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity to give you a brief high level overview and update on the building project. Um, so I was distracted here, sorry. Um, just a, a brief review of where, how we got to this point. Um, Groundbreaking was back in October of 2020. We had our topping out ceremony, March of 2021. That was where we placed the last metal beam in the structure. Um, anticipated possession date for us is February 18th. You'll notice the double asterisk there. I'll circle back to that in just a moment. Um, anticipated opening date, spring 2022. So the double asterisk is possession date. It's the day we get the keys to the building, we start moving in the furniture, start moving in the books and the bookshelves, all that sort of good stuff. That does not mean completion date. So we still have a number of things that will be continuing to be installed, put together, et cetera, et cetera. A, a number of those things are on back order with uh, the state of the world. Um, so the library board will need to decide what they're comfortable with opening with and without. So anticipated opening date of spring 2020, we're looking at potentially end of April, early May for our opening. So that will, I'll update you further on that as uh, the library board decides how the direction they wanna move forward in. So next slide, please. Um, a couple of fun pictures to show you. It's really neat to see the exterior signage on the outside of the building. This is a photograph on the left side of the south entryway. Similar signage on the north entryway door. Photograph on the right um, is demonstrating the installation of the casework and the laminate flooring. Um, this is a photo of the staff lounge of all places on the second floor of the building. Next slide, please. Tile work in the restroom being installed all over, all over the place. This is a representation from one of the restrooms on the second floor of the library. Um, continuing with the tile installation, you can see the backsplash on the right photograph, um, as well as casework installation. This is a photo on the right side from our art studio area. Next slide, please. Carpet installation going on on second floor. This is a photograph on the left side. Uh, representing our teen services area. So this is where our teen collection will be. It's where the teen staff librarian will be located. Um, photograph on the right is showing uh, completion of the masonry for our second floor fireplace. I have a little 
joke, if you will, um, for the reason I included this photograph. When I first got to Marion uh, and started touring the new building, I was very concerned with the weather tightness, if that's a phrase, for the building. And every time it rained, I would go in and that particular spot would always have water on the floor. And I was told that that would be rectified when we got the flashing installed prior to the masonry being installed. And lo and behold, once that flashing was installed where the chimney met the ceiling and roof, uh, the leaking stopped. So I'm, I'm happy to report that the, the leaking has ceased. I've since been in there with a, on warm days when the snow is melting. So we're good, we're, we're, we're watertight for that particular location. Next slide, please. Um, additional casework installation in, in, on the left side there in our children's interactive area. Um, that is where the big interactive accessible tree and play area is going to be on the first floor. Um, photograph on the right is the grand staircase that connects first and second floor located near the main entryways um, between the north and, and south entryways. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, things to look forward to, uh, tile floor installation. Um, in our tech and makerspace area is nearing completion. Uh, first floor ceiling grid and tile are starting to be placed and installed. Um, there was a slight delay with that with getting some of the infrastructure installed there, but that is underway. Furniture and fixtures are set to be delivered and installed starting in February. Um, and the West Elevator um, has its final inspection in late January. Next slide, please. Not gonna bore you with all of the numbers. I will hit you with the important facts is that um, as of December 31st, through our city finance department reporting, we are still trending under budget for the overall project. We are approximately 67.5% complete with the project. Um, I'll call your attention to the third from bottom line in the building area, yellow section for contingency. And that dollar amount of $518,164 um, is for contingencies when things go wrong, when contractors need more money. Um, as of December 31st, zero money has been, has been expended from that category. So very good news there. Yep, we're, we're, we're all knocking on wood. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so that is the, the, the high level overview of where we are with the building project. I'm gonna turn it over to Amy Geiger for just a moment or two. Um, Amy is our foundation director. She will give you an update on the capital campaign. Thank you, welcome Amy. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you our exciting news. You've seen some wonderful pictures of a beautiful building and I get to follow that up with a wonderful, equally wonderful story about the support that we've received from businesses and individuals in the area. Um, when you look at this, keep in mind <clears throat> that we have $3 million budget or $3 million goal to raise funds for the building project and a $300,000 goal for the mobile library. <clears throat> so in that top category, you see that of the $3.3 million total uh, funds that the foundation is raising, we've raised $3,007,320 and it shows the breakout of what we've raised for the building so far and what we've raised for the mobile library. So when we look at the next level, it's the balance left to raise. So for the building, we're looking at 206,479 and actually that number changed today. <laughs> the number changes almost daily, which is exciting. Um, and then the mobile library, we have 86,000 uh, left to raise there. Thought it was interesting to see where that, those funds are coming from. So the donor data, we've had five major foundations in the area come through with over $1.1 million. 48 businesses and organizations today contributing over 1.4 million and 210 individuals, which again, that number has increased today uh, to 425,000. Next slide, please. So when we talk about next steps from the fundraising standpoint, um, and we're looking at about $200,000 left to raise for the building. We are continuing to meet with prospective donors. We have a list of folks that we haven't visited with yet um, and also coming up with some new ideas uh, for people. So we've got a, myself and a variety of people, mayor included, visiting with some folks to talk about uh, their support for the campaign. Also doing additional research and applying for grants that are out there. We do have, uh, 
about $50,000 in pending asks right now. So that number continues to grow and we're just continuing to visit with people. We did do a direct mail solicitation, about 4,500 pieces went out in the Marion zip code area. And we've brought in about $14,000 from that uh, um, endeavor so far, <clears throat> which for a direct mail is very good. Uh, they say a 2% return is considered very successful. We've had a 1% return so far and almost doubled the amount that we thought we would bring in. For me in the fundraising world, it's equally exciting because it's all new donors. So it has been a great donor acquisition um, ex experience for us as well. Donor wall will have a beautiful way to acknowledge folks that have contributed to the library. And we're working on finalizing that layout and the room sponsorship ship signage actually walked through the building and looked at each area to make sure that there's a, what makes sense, where are we putting the signage for each of the places that people have sponsored and what that's looking like. So it's a very important detail and certainly important to the folks that have supported these different uh, rooms and that sort of thing. We are also looking at beginning to plan for the grand opening. Um, as we look at our date of actually opening to the public, what, what will that event look like? We'd like to do a prior event for our donors, our key donors that have given to the, the project. So we'll keep you all posted on that. Just a couple of side notes that I think are exciting. I don't know if you have been aware, but the foundation was working under the auspice of Friends of the Library and shared their 501c3 status. And in November, we were granted our own identity, if you will. So. <laughs> The foundation is now its own 501c3 with our own EIN number, which is pretty exciting for us. So we're going through organizational documents and that sort of thing to do updates. Back in November, the um, Eastern Iowa AFP, it's the Association of Fundraising Professionals, has a National Philanthropic Awards Day. Do you mind if I take this off? Thank you. <laughs> I should have done that earlier. Um, the foundation nominated Farmer State Bank to be recognized by this group for the years of uh, benevolent service to this community and really in, a, in some fashion kind of quiet. They just do the right thing and they go about their business. And they represent the largest corporate gift to the library project with a $250,000 gift from, a, from an organization. We were thrilled that they were selected as the uh, 2021 outstanding large philanthropic organization. So when you see any of the neighbor family, or stop in, please thank them and, and acknowledge that. It was a really, a very, very nice honor. Also would like to acknowledge somebody in our midst today, Mayor Nick has uh, personally made a commitment to do fundraising for the library project and has really gone above and beyond. I just run behind as fast as I can to keep up with him, get what he needs and, and keep going. And he has really um, just been a huge advocate for this project, talked with a lot of people, <laughs> Um, I just want to take a second just to share with you that um, this normally doesn't happen this way, okay? So he, he'll send an email to somebody and I'll think, well, we'll get about a $5,000 gift. And the next thing I know, he's calling me and saying, gosh, we got a $50,000 gift. I have had my draw, jaw drop literally many times, but it's a real um, tribute, not only to the project, but to your mayor. There's a level of respect out there. He's lending credibility to this project and it has brought a lot of, of really spectacular giving. Um, and so I appreciate what you're doing and I, I know that others do as well. So I wanted to do a shout out to you. And Bob Hoyt, if you see Bob, he's one of our co-chairs and he has equally been as busy, busy pounding the pavement and talking to people and sharing the word and getting some, some really great gifts coming in. It is a team effort. We cannot do this alone. It takes everybody. So appreciate that and just wanted to say thank you. Thanks, Amy. Any questions? Questions. Thank you. Good job. I mean, it's incredible that we're at this point, almost almost to the goal. We, so anyone who has any contacts out there, potential donors, uh, get the materials from Amy and uh, Bill. Wait, do you have anything else left to say? Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, any, questions? any questions for Bill? All right. Well, we look forward to the ribbon cutting. Absolutely. That's going to be an exciting day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our final item is a discussion 
regarding community design standards. So, Tom? Yes, I just wanted to give a, a, a brief update on uh, where we are with design standards and ask for a little direction as we just talk in general terms. I don't have specific ordinance to go through today, but I just want to uh, provide an opportunity for the council to understand kind of where the community development department is as we start to look forward and, and move into a, a, a conversation in the community for design standards. Um, as the council is very aware, design standards have been in place, but it's been kind of choppy and chunky. We've got we don't have overall community design standards. We've had corridors, certain corridors have had design standards. Um, Central Corridor, for example, um, when we rezoned Tower Terrace, we, we rezoned to the same standards as a corridor and individual rezonings have had different standards across the community. Um, for a very long period of time, there was a uh, position from the planning department to move towards design standards. Uh, there wasn't a lot of support uh, in the past from the council to, to push us over the edge to get to those standards. Um, so I, you know, that's a, we've tried to implement them on a kind of as, as we go basis. And I'm taking this back to the early 2000s and moving it forward. Um, as we've rezoned the community, we're halfway through, we've got two wards rezoned. We're moving in the spring, we'll be moving to rezone the rest of the community. Um, we wanted to bring back the design standards conversation there's been, with this council, there's been a lot of uh, questions about those. I think particularly in November, we brought forward a conversation about uh, in some industrial buildings out on Highway 13. I think the mayor had asked for, um, you know, hey, what are we doing with the design standards? And I said, if there's some direction, we would proceed to, to, to upgrade those and take them to a community-wide standard. We've been working internally. We've, we've looked at other communities to see what they've been doing and what they, what they do, in fact, do. Um, and, and so that's where I'm at today. We've done that research and I just want to bring it back to the community. Um, one of the uh, areas that we have looked at or one community we have looked at is Ankeny. Ankeny, I think uh, if you looked at the recent growth, they, they grew like, I think 25,000 people uh, over the last 10 year period of time. I think they've actually went to two planning commission meetings a month to keep with development. We're not quite there yet. Um, but we do like to look at what they do from a process perspective. Um, I'm personal friends with uh, the uh, planning director out there. So, you know, we have conversations about how they operate. Um, and, and so it's very important to see it look to a fast growing community as we start to look at what we would like to do and proceed with. Um, can you go to the next slide, Terrell? So what, the, what they have done is they've moved into a site plan review process that gets approved by their planning commission. Um, so, for example, uh, the apartment building that we were talking about at the last meeting, uh, that building plan would be submitted, uh, there would be a site plan and design review would occur at the same time. So currently we do internal site plan review. If the zoning doesn't require the council or the planning commission to look at it, so if it's not a plan development or uh, in a district where there's a, well, even in a district where there's a design review, it doesn't mean it necessarily goes to the planning commission or the city council. It can be done at the staff level on Tower Terrace Road. Some of that can be done at the staff level. Some of it does come to the planning commission, ultimately the city council. Um, what gets done in Ankeny, it's any, any building, commercial, multifamily, goes through the design process. So that apartment building process, whether it was PUD, whether it was straight zoning, whether it was whatever that situation was, it would go through a design review process where there are standards applied to it staff would review it, make recommendation to the planning commission. The planning commission then makes um, uh, the approval. Yes, that meets the standard and that it gets forwarded on. If there's a disagreement with the city or with the planning commission, so let's say um, the uh, planning commission doesn't like it or, or changes things and the petitioner wants uh, relief or wants something different, then it would go to the city council uh, for review and the city council would have a, uh, an opportunity to overturn the planning commission's decision or the developer um, would, would have the opportunity to turn over the planning commission's decision with a three-fourths vote. So the way they've structured it, it's not necessarily a variance. It goes to the, it goes to the city council. Uh, understanding that design considerations are pretty important to this group, that was some of the direction we were looking at going. So what I, to take this kind of into a, a broader perspective, 
uh, the city would develop standards. I would say that we would work towards standards similar to the central corridor standards where there'd be a percentage of brick um, and hardy materials, there'd be a percentage of trim. And then um, we would address some signage and lighting considerations. This, we wouldn't go into a great detail, you know, 20 page design standards. There'd be a lot of, a lot of uh, design detail up for interpretation. No different than we see now in our plan development districts. You guys have been seeing those uh, over time, uh, the central corridor review process, the MEC development review process be very similar to that situation. Um, but what we're, what we're looking at is developing the design standards and then within the ordinance, it would regulate that any commercial multifamily building, not industrial and not single family would, would then go to the, uh, go to uh, administrative review, recommendation to the planning commission, planning commission supports staff's decision. That's the, that's the end of the road and the permit can be issued. If there's disagreement, um, it would go to the city council for approval. There's two reasons for that. One is you guys would see a lot of projects. Um, and if there's, with, with the number of projects that come through, it might just kind of be a little overly uh, burdensome for you guys. The planning commission is there. They would interpret that. They've been doing it for a long time. It's kind of their role. But I, you know, I'm just kind of, illustrating how I would see this ordinance coming through. Um, uh, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, not really looking for a whole lot of direction, just are, are we on the right track? One, developing an ordinance with some general design standards similar to the corridor standards. And two, um, if we moved forward and, and had uh, internal review, goes to planning commission for review. If there's disagreement of planning commission, it goes to city council. So just kind of throwing that out there for thoughts from the council. What? Yes, so Sorry. it sounds great, right? Based on the conversations we've been having up to this point, um, this is getting into the weeds and I understand that, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway. One of the things that we've spent a lot of time on, I feel like in a conversation with some development is the whole stacking of cars and right the idea of drive through would this be something that would be a part of these design standards or is that sort of too far into the weeds with these design standards so that it's actually a separate standard um, and that we are working on that would be a, an ordinance that would that would be a separate ordinance within the zoning that would require certain stacking requirements for a drive through restaurant so the difference between design standards and a, a general development standard, uh, the design standards would really go to the point of saying, okay, when a building gets brought forward, it's got to have so much brick. Uh, you can't use, uh, we don't want metal buildings on 7th Ave. So if you would have those standards that say 60% has to be of a primary material. 30% of a trim material, and then there would be like a, a little leeway in there for that last 10%. Um, and the developer would take that, put together the proposal and submit it. Um, and then that would go through the review for a process. Uh, the standards, like a drive-through standard, let's say the standard is uh, you gotta have stacking for 12 cars. That, that standard wouldn't come to the council. That standard would just be in place unless, unless that project is, has 12 cars, it does not get a permit unless they go for a variance. So that's the difference between having a standard in place and, and design review. Um, does that make sense? It does. So what, just to make sure I understood what you said. So what I heard you say is these two aren't really necessarily connected um, and you're working on both of them at this point and you're looking for direction on this larger sort of design standard and process of the design standard, right? Is that accurate? Correct. So, so where we're at is there, there are areas of the community commercial, commercially zoned or that are multifamily, have multifamily zoning that have no standards whatsoever. So um, air conditioner units, all vinyl, um, they, they get no review. We, we, they're, they're, they're entitled. So if they have the zoning, they bring the project in, we, we, we have no opportunity, and the mayor and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. All we can say is, hey, can you please make this better? 
Like that's all we got. <laughs> so with standards in place and saying, hey, we need to, the game needs to be upped. We want to see a percentage of, of primary materials that are hardy. I'm, I'm just using that word. So uh, stone, brick, uh, hardy board, not vinyl. Um, we could say we want 60% this, so much glass, 30% trim materials, identify what those are. And we have those in the corridor. We have them on Tower Terrace Road. Um, the developer would submit those and then we would take it for, through a review process for final approval so that staff is not necessarily uh, making interpretations. So if it goes to, it would go to the planning commission for those reviews. So in response to that, right, thank mm -hmm. you. I think, right, it makes a whole lot of sense to do that because now everybody understands the rules of the game, right? We're very clear on what we're expecting because we want our community to sort of be represented in a certain way. And the folks that want to be engaged with developing in our community, it's very crystal clear, right? That this is sort of what's expected in the process in which you need to go through in order to do that work. So I think anytime we can make right expectations as clear as we can, it just solves a lot of challenges that we've probably been presented with up to this point. So that's on that. I agree. And like Tom said, you know, we, we get into a lot of the conversation with like, you know, somebody wants to put a metal building on highway 13 and well, we, we don't have design standards. That's a really important corridor, 151, the entryways to the city, you know, all those important areas. And like, I think what you said is, is key because uh, the time to uh, ask for the, for the improved uh, look of a building, I mean, it's too late when they've already bought the land, they've invested in design, and then they come to us and they want, you know, and then then, then we then we find try to find ways to, to make them up their game a little bit. I mean, it, having that cl clarity before they even think about a project, so they know this is what can go here, or this is what can be built here, then, you know, they're, they're making those, uh, those decisions based on information. Um, and it's, it's just good for everybody to have the clarity. Um, so I, I really, really appreciate uh, this, this, this project. And I think it's, it's, it's uh, very needed and it's very timely as we see 151 explode out that way and Highway 13 North and all of that. So yeah, Sarah, and then, and then we have uh, um, Grant and then you, Steve, you had something too? Okay. Tom, I think you probably know my position on this because going back to our days with blue zones project um, this was part of what we looked at with healthy communities and having design standards was one of those that um, there was a lot of discussion around and a lot of question with and what we saw in model communities of things that were healthy well being even beyond the aesthetic and I know you taught me quite a bit when um, there was a discussion where someone said why did an X chain get to put in this building and it was all, well, they know a community that has design standards or not. And they're gonna come in with plan A, plan B or plan C based on what that community and they're almost building to our minimum requirement. They're not gonna do any more than they have to because it's a, it's a money game. So I greatly appreciate you bringing this conversation forward. Um, process wise, I'm new enough to this. I'll, I'll default a little bit on what works best, but I will say if you're looking for <coughs> approval and support, I think, um, this has been discussed for a long time and I'm glad to see that it's coming back up again, especially when we're seeing some of the growth in the area and trying to get ahead of it. So thanks for doing that. Grant and yeah. Steve. Thank you. Um, Tom, on this slide, the second to the last bullet point uh, covers when the planning commission does, denies a request. Was there, um, uh, what, how is a, uh, a developer variance or a requested variance handled in this in this scheme. I think you mentioned it, but I, I I didn't follow exactly how that interfaces in the total process. So the difference the difference in a between a variance and the design review. There may be some interpretation in the design review process. Um, trying to think of a, a good example. Maybe it's a new material is brought forward. Uh, recently, we had uh, someone wanted to build with a material that was similar to a hardy board, but it was kind of a vinyl product. So similar to what Mike says, they go through these books and they bring them forward, but maybe there's a, a product that's not really defined. Okay. And we say, hey, you know what? That design looks pretty good. Maybe 
or maybe we it doesn't look we're not going to approve it well the developer may say you know what we really like this product and we want to we want to take this for an additional consideration from the city council so it's more of an interpretation okay. the variance would be um hey you know what uh there's a 25 foot <coughs> setback and we only want to go 20. that's specifically listed in the code and that would require the zoning board of adjustment so it's almost like more of a design interpretation that would be identified. Okay, that so that would be besides a denial, that would be the other category of thing we could possibly see. Yep. Well, I certainly support development of some standards. And if you have that kind of uh, abnormality where a new material is being uh, requested, quite honestly, this would this would fit into a potential revision of the standards if that's a common material that's being used in the industry. So um, I, I'm supportive of this overall approach and it seems like it'll take cycle time out of the total decision process. And it, it, it would also add some uniformity to it. Like right now we have a problem that Tower Terrace Road has certain standards, the corridor has certain standards. Now we'll still have some areas where there's a planned unit development that maybe was built around a certain development designs like the neighborhood in Indian Creek um, and the central quarter may still have different standards but when you're just straight zoning you would have a baseline design standard um, and I think that would provide some um, clarity to the development community and we're not talking about single family homes at this point we haven't really focused on industrial zoning uh, areas as well um, we would be primarily focused on the commercial and uh, multifamily if there's a desire when we bring stuff forward to talk about industrial, we can do that as well. But those are the focus right now, just to get moving forward. And I just point out like a good a good point to what uh, 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 Sarah had indicated was Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't know that they've repainted, but when they brought in a proposal, they have to rebrand. A lot of these commercial entities have to rebrand. If you've driven through a community where the where they've you've seen the red white striped building plan. For Kentucky Fried Chicken, that's their Model A. That's the one they want the most of. It's bright white and red. Looks like a candy cane. When they brought that forward, we have a provision in this corridor that does not allow uh, bright colors. We want muted and earth tone colors. It's just a general statement. But for that statement, we would have this candy cane Kentucky Fried Chicken there. All we did was just say, hey, you know what? We've got this this line, so it's really not going to fly. So, oh, well, you'll you'll need model B. Then <laughs> they submit it. Right. I, it. It is amazing right. the difference, and I will tell you that. And I know I'm belaboring this, but like <clears throat> Walmart was the was the most humiliating project that I've ever been a part of. When when they came in, because they've been everywhere, right? Big box when they were building big box stores. Uh, they had seen every ordinance under the sun. They walked in and they had a checklist three pages long. And they said, do you have an ordinance that says how much glass? No. Do you have an ordinance that talks about how high your signs are? You know, they just went through and they must have went through 30 or 40 questions about what you had in your design standards. And at the end, of the, at the end they said, thank you. And then they sent you the plan that they wanted. <laughs> And it was, uh, right. <laughs> that was one of the, we got a pretty nice Walmart. I'm not, I'm not. But it highlights the point that where you they will give you the minimum that you require. Yeah. I mean, it's you've just, all seen that's a just Walmart a, in yeah. some of the destination right. cities. Right. And, yeah. So yeah. anyway, there's, there's just a lot to be said for design standards. Yeah. So Tom, I'm, I'm okay. And certainly in support of upping our design standards. So are they, is this being done by zoning? In other words, if I think of Highway 13 versus Tower Terrace, are those gonna be different design standards if they're zoned the same or the same design standards based upon what we'd like the zoning? What, what we're going for at this point are, are uh, across the board general design standards. So, um, there'd be baseline so okay there are certain, we have certain areas where there are above their standards are above so the planned development districts <clears throat> so neighbor indian creek that has a whole 40 right. page ordinance that right. regulates the central corridor has its own zoning district standards right. we're trying to we'll, we'll try to make them as similar as possible um 
but as property is rezoned, we wouldn't attach the conditions for the design standards to them. It just They would just be regulated by the ordinance that is in place for the community as a whole. Now, that's not to say that you can't do that. I mean, you can do, hey, we want Highway 13 and 151 to have a higher design. Any building that faces those needs to be brick. You know, there, there are ways to do that. Um, and I think that can come as we start talking about the standards. I think at this point, I'm just trying to let you know that we're, we're working on the standards. Right now, we're working off of the Ankeny plan and that that would be that we would create the standards, city would review them, planning could make a final determination and then the city council would be kind of the uh, referee in the event there's a indecision. So my other comment is about, uh, it kind of sounds like there'll be more plans going through PNZ than currently. And typically PNZ is making their decision based upon does this site plan or project meet the requirements technically? Now, city council looks beyond that. And we've had difference of opinions in the past year on a couple of items with PNZ. So do you anticipate as if that process were to go forward in the manner you described that we would have PNZ looking beyond those technical requirements and looking more at say aesthetics, looking more at some of these other aspects that city council has sometimes looked at and made decision changes or will it still be more technical? I think whenever you start talking about design, you're gonna get into that interpretation. Um, so I think there'll be some, some interpretation as on the design side. There's gonna be, the way this would move forward is we'd be looking at a site plan with the design elevations because it's very difficult. I think we've even been confused when we bring forward something that has a design aspect and all of a sudden like the Jeff Witters project, uh, the loss, we were talking about fire hydrants and, and yeah. park. Some of that was more site plan related than, than what the actual <coughs> ordinance was specifically identifying was the design side of it, but we were talking about it all at the right. same time. Um, <clears throat> so my, I think we'll be looking at a little bit of both, but certainly there'll be more leeway on the design side of that conversation at the planning commission. And I would want them to be doing that if they're gonna be looking at more and that's the direction and we're gonna have these design standards, mm -hmm. I'd expect some of their decisions to be, to be a little bit more beyond just the technical requirements. Gee, it has a 15 foot setback and whatever yep. that they're looking beyond that of, is this a good project for this yeah. area as well? Okay, thank you. Okay. City manager. So just, um, I, I'm gonna share just because I left the community where we just established design standards. And basically what you're doing is you're creating a, a, a booklet for the city of Marion, these are th this is the look and feel that we want as buildings and developments are coming through our community. So that template, that palette of colors and textures, that's what the work that Tom and the Planning and Zoning Commission would do to develop that recommendation to you all to get that get the buy-in, get the clarity. So then, when when our staff is working with these developers, we're saying. Oh, doesn't meet this, this is what we're looking for. Here's the picture, then you got to adapt it. So, so Councilman Jensen, to your point, it will, in a lot of areas, help streamline that process, make staff's job much easier. This is what we're looking for. This is what our elected officials are looking for. This is what our community is looking for. You got to meet these standards. If not, then you have to go ask for permission to deviate from that. Um, but establishing these standards, as Tom was talking about, it's going to come to council for final blessing and then that also makes sure that there's there's alignment between council and the the um, recommending boards and commissions it's the alignment i think that's really key because then right now we have you know a developer that the staff tries to push on them and say can you do better they don't have the teeth to do it the developer comes to us and says they're not giving me what i want and you know and we have this kind of tension created and you know, it's just it's it, when that, when when there's clarity from the beginning before the investor even looks at the project, then that just makes things I think a lot easier. Uh, go ahead. To I appreciate what you said, Steve, and, and what you said, Ryan. But in my mind, I think the Planning and Zoning Commission should not put their opinions and things like that into the into their decision. 
or or look at I shouldn't say opinion look at uh, certain situations they should be black and white because they're the board that's going to enforce what we decide should be done so they should be all black and white and not have any leeway on anything unless they were elected if they were elected a bo an elected board then maybe they would have some leeway and things but they should be looking at everything black and white um i had a couple other things too um so if <laughs> if the commission denies a request are the is the developer allowed to request it come to the council for a program and then uh so what you said about the standard so if, if it's something zoned commercial it's going to be the same standard across the board in the entire city so that's what you said right same with multifamily. well the issue with that that i have is when it comes to low income so you're going to have some you're going to want some low income multifamily houses out there well if you've got the design standards in place that you have to have brick on here and this and that you can't do vinyl can't do plain that's going to raise the cost of the building which is going to raise the cost of the rent it's going to it's going to hurt the low income it also comes with with commercial too if you got someone looking to start a business somewhere and they're looking for low in or low rent well if you have a design standard where you've got all these new buildings are getting built and they have to be to this specific design it's going to raise the cost of the building and it's going to raise the cost of the rent so some businesses won't be able to get off the ground or find a place because rents are going to be too high for them to be in marion and they're going to go to cedar rapids they're going to go to high or where not where else so what I'm getting at is kind of what you said is that this should be specific areas should have specific design standards. So if it is along the corridor on 151 or 13, higher standards. If it's, I'm trying to think of an example of somewhere else in the town that's not, you know, a, a focal point where we're trying to, you know, an, an entry point of the city, something where there can be lower standards, and that sounds bad, lower standards, but lower cost to build something so that lower income people can rent or lower um, or business, some startup businesses can find a place with lower rent. Um, so I would think it'd be best to do specific areas have specific requirements based off of where they're at in the city. That all makes sense. I was kind of rambling. Because <laughs> I don't want, I wouldn't want to hurt, I wouldn't want to hurt the low income because I mean, we've got some low income housings I know the chiefs over there looking at me like, well, we don't want all that. Anyway, um, <laughs> I know, but some of the some of what I'm thinking in my head, the fourplexes that are not very nice, but they're low income. And we, we need those low income places in town. I shouldn't say they're not very nice. They're, you know, correct. Aesthetically, they're not very, they're vinyl on the outside, window air conditioning is on the buildings. We need that in some areas of town because that is the lower income that's what lower income people can rent. Okay, so go ahead. Just uh, Councilman Brandt, that's great feedback. And that's something that we would take back. And as we start working on developing these standards, working with the Planning and Zoning Commission on developing these uh, for ultimately your consideration, those are things that we can take into consideration. Um, there, are, there are some ways to navigate that too. Um, when you're designing your template of what's acceptable, there are um, a lot of times it's not brick, but there is some sort of acceptable material that may look like brick. So those are those are options that as we're exploring that. So um, it's it's not cut and dry uh, as you're developing new standards. It's it we're just, we're developing the Marion ways is right. really what you're what what we're asking for permission to do. And I'm I'm all for reaching higher and the and the best developers bringing the best, but there's also that aspect where. We, we don't want to push people out of building in Marion because the design standards are too high for what they actually can build and what they're looking for, uh, the, their market that they're looking for. Yeah, that's all I think. Good point. And, and I, don't, I don't think that this is intended to do that at all. I, I, you know, there are communities where they, know, they, they tell you exactly what needs to go on this corner. And, uh, you know, I don't think this is getting anywhere near that. It's, it's just setting some standards for quality uh, and aesthetics, because the curb appeal of your community matters, and it brings everything up when 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 you drive through the community, and it says who we are uh, and how much we care about our community. And, I, and I'm, I have every confidence that this will allow for the flexibility for all types of socioeconomic uh, uh, levels. Um, you know, I, I go back to 
this may not have been the case even a few years ago, but we're, we're really at the beginning, I think, of a great uh, period of, of development and, and expansion in Marion. And we get one chance to do it right. We get this one chance to do it right. Um, and I wanna be able to look back in 20 years and say, wow, everybody in this room, everyone on this council, they really had the right vision and look how great this community looks. Uh, and it's become the desired community where everybody wants to locate. Uh, people want to be part of something like that. Businesses want to locate in a place like that. Um, so I, I, I applaud it and think it's been needed for a long time, but it's certainly very timely now as we are really on the verge, I think, of seeing a lot of a lot of great development um, happen. So thank you. You have one more thing? Just, Go ahead. Just one question. Um, back on this second to last bullet point on the slide here, um, how does the three quarters vote accommodate a council member absence or um, um, otherwise not uh, being available, I guess, uh, to uh, abstain? from a determination. And I guess I'm just wondering, is three quarters vote a little bit robust for what we're trying to do? I'll, I'll, I'll work on that a little bit. I, I'll be honest, it's, it's, I believe it goes back to the state code on overturning a planning commission ruling okay. actually. Um, so, but I'll work with Kara on that. There, it would be a process and procedure that we would just work with. Okay, yep. all right, thanks. Okay, anything else on that topic? Does that bring us to the end of the, Agenda? I think so. <laughs> okay, great meeting, great discussions this evening. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you on Thursday. You